All right, guys, how you doing? Second session today. I didn't get to deal with Hamza Yusuf. Hamza Yusuf. Yeah, I'm Sheikh on Bart of the Spirit. Yeah, I'm Sheikh of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' almighty name. <clears throat> Keep praying for me, guys. Pray. So, in Jesus' name. Okay. Okay, please, this guy. Sorry about the distractions, guys. Oh, it says me what I name. Yeah, Rafa Fosse is my name. Yeah, you're gonna get distracted. You know how it works here. We get distracted. But anyway, welcome, guys. Shanim Raj. Falafel B. Hey, how you doing? Frank. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Okay, hold on, guys. Um, I'm live right now, Aziza. That's why I say don't text because they can hear you. Ding, ding, ding. Watch me, Aziza. Shapira. Shapira. I'm on both. I'm not on TikTok. I don't go to TikTok. I'm on YouTube, Facebook. You know, Shapira, they hear you. Allah Baruch will come watch me. Yalla, Azizi. I had to call him because my brother here, if I didn't call him, he would text me. So, guys, what's up, Archive? Good to see you. <clears throat> Chris, you're early. What do you mean you're early, man? Steadfast Godcast. At what time is it in your neck of the woods? Sherokin Marokir. Eria Kabaris. I wish. I wish, sister. I wish. Uh, my camera is a little blurry. Is it okay? From scale to one to five, how is the camera, the visual? One to five. Brooklyn Warrior for Christ. I got to meet you, brother. I got to meet you. So, guys, welcome. Hopefully, it will be a spirit-filled session. Spirit fills us and use me to glorify Jesus Christ. Bless you. Okay. Cristiano. Everyone said here it's five. Rachel Zazevich. 3.30 p.m.? Okay. Now, I don't know if you guys are pulling my leg. Hey, John, but Didisha, what's up, buddy? Huh? More like pussycat, huh? You remember the earlier session? How is the visual? John, I'm, I'm in a coma, man. I'm in a food coma. I made the mistake of eating pizza today. I went because of this guy, Dave. There's a guy on... There's a guy on... What do you call it? I got to shave the back of my head. Anyway, there's a guy on YouTube. He does pizza reviews. So he was... In my neck of the woods, I can't tell you where because for the safety of the people around me. That's why I try not to give out the location of my cousins here. But if John Bedadishu keeps it up, I may give out his location. Maybe so I can help him become a martyr for Christ so he can receive the, the martyr's crown, right? Keep messing with me, buddy. I know where you live. Anyway, so... Is the visual okay? Because I don't know if you guys are pulling my leg. I said one to five. Someone said three and a half. Someone said four. Someone said five. May the Lord Jesus bless the audio visual qualities that they're optimal. I'm using whatever I have on my computer. I don't have a professional studio. I don't make that kind of money to have a ministry where I can hire staff, pro you know, produce state-of-the-art equipment, but that doesn't matter. The Lord Jesus can take a few loaves, and a few fish and can take two pennies and do wonders and multiply them and feed millions because he's the almighty God who is infinitely powerful and rich. So you're a Syrian too, Aziza? Lord, the Father, says, great. So guys, here's what you need to do for me. Help me to help you. The least important thing is to hit the like button, share this on your social media platforms, which I know many of you don't do like John Beddadishu. You think he shares it on his social media platforms, <laughs> this guy? Anyway, secondly, when class begins, <clears throat> I need you to stay focused. Ask Holy Spirit to strengthen my throat and my voice so I'm his mouthpiece. And you give your undivided attention because it's a class. So in a class, used by the Spirit to teach you. And then I'm going to be looking at your comments, see if you're getting it. That's why I get distracted because it's a class. It's not... So where I ignore your comments and you guys can chew the fat. We want to make this a class 
where we learn our faith, the depth of our faith, so the Holy Spirit will destroy every fear and doubt, unbelief we have, strengthen us to move mountains, assuring us the Bible is his word and Jesus is Lord, and have no doubt and fear nothing, not even death, because Jesus is alive. So I want you to focus. And then the most important thing, be prayed up. Say a prayer in your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Ask the Holy Spirit to use me, his mouthpiece, because we are his disciples and he is our teacher. You're not my disciples. And I say this and I'm going to say this until the Lord takes me home. So we wait a few minutes. You know how it works. We don't go into the topic right away because we wait a few minutes for the regular show up. And if the Lord is pleased, increase the numbers for his glory, not for my praise, but give me contentment. And then we'll pray. But I do ask one prayer request of you guys. And I mean this from my heart. You guys have been with me. You know, sometimes I'm too open to the point that it hurts me. Meaning I'm such an open book because I really don't care what people think unless they're trying to discredit the work of the Lord in me. Then I get angry, but may God give me righteous anger. And sometimes I'm too open with the wrong people and it backfires, which that's fine. But it's because I know the Bible is true. Let me repeat, because I, because I know the Bible is true. <clears throat> the God of the Bible is real. The Lord lives. And when the Bible says that God delights in the prayers of the righteous, Proverbs 15, verse 8, Proverbs 15, verse 8, write these passages down. And then go back and prayerfully study them. Proverbs 15, verse 8. Okay, that's one. All right? We'll write those down. James 5, start from 13 all the way to 20. But you can read James 5, 13 to 16. But read all the way to 20. Right? Even Ephesians 6, 19 to 20, about Paul saying, pray for him that God will open a door. Or Philippians 1, 19. And then the importance of praying ceaselessly. Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. Luke 18, verse 1 to 8. The Bible says God is in love with his church, his children, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And the more you walk in union with the Holy Spirit, the more you crucify your flesh, the more powerful your prayers are because the Lord delights in the prayers of the righteous. Zrama, please do me a favor. Don't come here and distract us. I'm going to block you. Okay, focus, all right? So I open up because I'm in need of the mercy, grace, and pity and compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ, like all of us. And I'm in need of your prayers because God responds to your prayers in love. And the Lord calls us to pray for one another. Pray for one another. As I muzzle filthy dogs, these dumb bastards, again, they start. And now you're a bastard, you're spiritual filth, and I'm going to remind you of who you are. As the Lord Jesus enables me to muzzle you dogs who bark in the comment section. But for the rest of you paying attention, I'm in need of your prayers that God in his mercy, as he's patient with me and I'm patient, I need to be patient. Give me the grace of discipline that he has been pleased to give me and never give me what I deserve. I used to cry out to the Lord for years. Lord, help me to control my food addiction as well as my lust because i struggle with two things among many other things but two things two vices that i really struggle with lust and food addiction and for years i struggled with gluttony and obesity god in his mercy was pleased to give me power and the discipline starting in october 2017 and since october 2017 now in 2023 god has been pleased to give me grace and power and discipline to lose this weight and keep it off for my health and for my psychological well-being. And he has been pleased to strengthen me to give me self-control. My fear is always this, that I upset the Holy Spirit, disappoint the Holy Spirit, that he then hands me over to what I deserve. God forbid, may the Lord never hand me over. So I ask you to keep praying that God in his mercy will give me self-control, self-discipline to live in pure worship and holiness and obedience to Jesus Christ and the discipline to stay fit and not succumb again to obesity or gluttony and overcome my lust for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit, because it's always a struggle. So there are days in which it's easier than others, but ask the Spirit in His mercy to continue to empower me with self-discipline 
to stay fit, get healthier, and use my help to glorify Jesus and love Jesus Christ more and not to be lip service because I say that because today I watched that guy Dave on YouTube. He's this famous guy who goes around and he tells you the best pizza places and he rates them. Well, he happened to rate a particular pizza joint. He's all over. He's in New York. He's in Florida, Chicago, California, Michigan, Arizona, everywhere. So if you are in a particular state or city, go to his channel, and then you type in your state, and he'll go and tell you the pizza places, and he gives you their score. Well, because I'm stupid, I decided to watch one of his videos where he mentioned a pizza place, and he gave it 7.8. First, it was going to be 7.8, but he said 7.7, 7, but he goes, I was going to go 7.8. And because I'm a pizza junkie, guess what I did? Right after the first stream, guess what I did? See, John Baditi, she was laughing because he knows me. John and I, John knows, what's up, Sonny Malky? I just want everyone to know that Sonny Malky is in the hizzy. I know, brother, I love you. I won't give you a location. But Sonny Malky is a handsome Assyrian stud muffin. May the Lord Jesus bless his family, children. The Lord bless his business as he glorifies Christ. He's one of the best when it comes to the real estate. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Sonny, 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 oh, Sonny, Sonny, oh, Sonny, Sonny making that money and he makes me look too funny. Give me some of that honey from that money, Sonny. Yeah, I'm a prophet. I'm a poet. Now you know it. I love this brother. Good man, good family, and I don't just say it to say it. John, you know what I'm talking about, lah. Anyway, Akhuni, I can't give away your location. You know why, lah? Because you understand, it's Mushilman, eh? That would want to harm people that I love. May God protect all of you and protect us. So I can't give away too much. The man, I know him from my teenage years. John Bedadishu knows him too. Beautiful family, beautiful brothers. God bless them and prosper them and fill them with the spirit as they glorify Jesus. And he's a successful real estate. He's my man. When Sonny's around, no one sticks in inside his town because he makes us all look like clowns all right sonny making money oh yeah give me some of that honey you're too funny sonny all right anyway god bless you brother he gets me excited when i say it. but anyway he just told you who the guy is uh it's this guy see he hates him too dave portney boy i guess sonny he did a review today i don't want to give a location i went and bought extra large pizza and i inhaled it and I'm in a food coma. I'm recovering. So ask the Lord in his mercy, guys. And I mean this. I really mean this when I tell you, without the Holy Spirit constraining me, I know I am lost. There's no hope for me. And I mean this, and I'm not just saying this. So cry out to the Spirit to constrain and control us. And the Spirit in his love and mercy, give me that grace and constraint to stay tight, get back tomorrow on track, stay eating the way I'm eating, to keep it off, to use my health to glorify the Father, Son, and Spirit. Brother John Bedadishu, it was so good, I almost decided it's worth me going back to being 340 pounds and a gluttonous pig. That's how good the pizza was. And I hate this man because now I know how good this pizza is and I'm going to struggle until Jesus calls me home. Right? It was so good, I almost gave up saying, man, why am I trying to fight it, dude? I was born to be fat because I love food. Let me now just give it up, go back to becoming an obese pig where I can barely breathe and move and die of a heart attack. God forbid. But anyway, pray for me. May the Lord forgive me and give me grace. Never let me go and hand me over, but constrain me, please, for the glory of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. So I open that up, all joking aside, keep praying for me to stay victorious. That's right. Like, Aziza, how much I love you, Sonny. God knows. God bless all your family members. Again, you know why I can't mention too much. You understand. Some people think I'm joking when I say this. If the Muslims can find me and David Wood or Christian Prince, Osama Dakdok, Adam Seeker, <clears throat> Hatun Tash, you already saw they try to kill her. They would try to kill us. May God give us the power of the Holy Spirit. He's worthy that we die for him. May we live for him. But I don't want people whom I know and love to be affected. So I got to make sure I don't give out too much information. So, Sonny, if they come looking for you, say, man, I cannot stand Sam Shimon. I hate Sam Shimon. I pray he dies and that you burn his ashes. Right? So, anyway, love you, bro. 
So we'll just keep it that way. No, Now, John, I'm warning you, John. I know where you live, John. Sonny, I'll never give him up. I will never give up, Sonny. But you, John Betnadishu, though you're my cousin, and your dad and my dad were best of friends, I still <clears throat> regret the day that I found out you're my cousin. You keep it up, and I may get the Muslims your exact location and have them shish kebab you and offer you as Zabiha meat to Allah and his messenger. So you better be careful, buddy. Sonny, I'll never give up. Sonny's too funny, making that money. And he's sweeter than honey. But you're a clown, and I'm going to point them to your town. So you better not stick around. I'm a prophet. I'm a poet. Now you know it. <laughs> All right, anyway. Okay, can we ready to begin? We have an Armenian sister. That's the last name. Okay, are we ready, guys, to begin? So now, guys, all joking aside, please pray for me. God, give me discipline to stay tight and fit and never lose this victory for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So let's begin and pray, right? And I'm still recovering from that. Boy, that pizza was good. Oh, my goodness. Dave, I'm going to pray that they shut down your YouTube channel, that you get arrested, and that you get deported to a Muslim land, that you, Dave Portney, may they deport you to Pakistan, and that you never see another YouTube channel as long as I live. I'm not going to tell you, man. Anyway, let's begin, guys. Ready? Lord, the Father, the Spirit. Yeah, Rafa, Father, the Spirit. Is there someone very bothering you here? Hold on one second. Someone said, get out of here, Ray. What was Ray doing? Oh, Ray's acting up? All right. You guys ready? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which Ray are you guys talking about, Cristiano? I don't know who. You're attacking some guy, Ray. I don't know. Oh, you mean uh, Ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. The Chechenians did muta with his mother. Don't you know that? The Chechenians in Russia did muta with his mother. What's wrong with you? Okay, you guys ready? Let's begin. Lord, the false spirit. All right. In name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in the name of our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Holy Spirit, please. Grant us perfect self-control, self-restraint, self-constraint. Control our passions and give us perfect self-discipline. Set us free from the flesh. Destroy the fruits of the flesh and all the lusts of the flesh. Set us free, Holy Spirit. Those sins that we struggle with in common and those sins that are unique to us, set us free by your purifying fire, purging us and the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansing us and help me overcome gluttony and lust and to be victorious not for the praise of men not for vanity but for the glory of jesus christ your eternal love who's in love with you transform us and enable us and empower us to obey jesus christ by our deeds not be lip service not to be hypocrites and remove the beams from our eyes and control our tongues and our mouths purge our tongues and our mouths to never utter any wicked filthy <clears throat> blasphemous or idolatrous statement against the Lord Jesus, but love the Lord Jesus Christ even unto death and empower us to truly magnify Christ in the way we live. No matter what they do to us, we trust in you, Holy Spirit, that you are our power and our strength. Without you, we can do nothing. We trust in you. Perfect us for the glory of Christ. Fill us with your fruit, your power, your holiness, righteousness, and purity, <clears throat> your love, your compassion, your mercy, your graciousness, your compassion, your patience, your boldness, your fearless <clears throat> courage that comes from you and enable us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, offering up the fruit of our lips, holy hands, sanctified by you, Holy Spirit, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and do that for our loved ones. Do that for my daughters. Feed our loved ones, my daughters. Feed all of us the flesh of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, for our healing, for our salvation, for our holiness, for our <clears throat> nourishment, protection, deliverance, 
make us whole and heal us spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physically, and enable us to crush that of Satan on our feet by the blood of Jesus Christ and perfect the greatest gifts that the scriptures speak about. In 1 Corinthians 13, you say, through Paul, your servant, faith, hope, and love, and the greater of the three is love. Give us perfect faithfulness to be faithful to you. Hope beyond understanding, destroying our fears and doubts and unbelief, and give us the power to love the Lord Jesus by our deeds and love one another by our deeds to show we love Jesus, not for the praise of men. And do not allow us to prostitute ourselves for fame, for status, for position, for fortune, and never fall into any scandal to never dishonor Jesus Christ, that he will increase, sit and throne upon our hearts, the hearts of our loved ones, my daughters, forever and ever, filled by your power, Holy Spirit, to glorify Jesus Christ. Now take over the session, bless this session, and use my mouth, the gifts of ministry, perfect recall of every jot and tittle and fact, save me from error and stammering, and confusion, illuminate our hearts and our minds with wisdom, knowledge, understanding to know your word, Holy Spirit, and obey and live it out and love your word and be transformed by it and enable me to destroy this wicked religion. So Muslims will see the true God in Jesus Christ and flee Muhammad and fall in love with Jesus Christ and enable me to silence these perverts and blasphemers who pervert scripture to put the fear of God in them for the glory of Christ. Have your way. May I not be a nuisance to my neighbors. Bless the internet connection, the audiovisual qualities, and beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ. And again, give me the health I need, Holy Spirit. Strengthen my throat with health and vigor and make my voice pleasing to the ears of your servants. Guide us, Holy Spirit. You are the gift of the Father and Son to teach us, correct us, sanctify us, to empower us, to control us, and constrain us to glorify Jesus Christ. So we entrust ourselves to you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Bring them for your glory, the glory of Jesus, the glory of the Father, not for my praise. May I truly be humble and destroy pride, arrogance, and ego, and slothfulness, and laziness, and idleness, and idolatry, and covetousness, and every form of blasphemy, maliciousness, jealousy, and envy. Remove that from us. And fake piety. Fill us with your fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Glory to the Father, and to the Son. And to the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, rough, rough, rough. All right, let me put down the heat. Let's begin, guys. Some clips to play. In Jesus' name, may give me the victory. Stay tight. Man, you can't make heads or tails out of this weather. Sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. Ugh, ugh, ugh. Now, because we have some Assyrians on Facebook watching, I think I'm going to have to sing them some Assyrian songs. Right? I'm trying to... The, the problem with me is I don't remember the words of songs. Hey! Do my eyes deceive me? Two, hold on. Two other... Stud muffins are watching my channel. It says they are. It says Luke and Sammy. I don't want to give their full names. We got two Sammys and Luke. Luke, if you're watching, Brad Pitt ain't got nothing on you. This guy is so handsome, he makes models look ugly. He's like Hilaire and his family. The dude, God bless him and his family. Bless all of them, Sammy, all of them. The guy's so handsome that he makes models look ugly. Dude, God bless you. Shapira. Shapira, Leo, Shapira, oh, Shapira. All right, anyway. That's right, Sonny. Sonny, you a handsome babe, too. You want me to do all this? All right, now. I don't, I don't know any of them. Now. Thanks be to my friend, Sal, your pal, Rossino. He sent me two new clips, and I uploaded them. So let's play them so we can begin. Someone messaging me again? Let me see. I'll send you the link. Look, John Bedadishu even has my phone number. I think I got to block you, dude. Stop tempting me, man. I'm trying to recover from a... 
extra large pizza. I ate it all by myself, and I didn't even wait to get home. I ate it while I was driving. What's up, Hope? All right, here. Let's begin. We're going to begin in a couple minutes, guys. But here, what I want to show you is, thank you, Sal, your pal, Racino. This is what he did. He sent me these videos because he's not a hater like some people. Look what he sent me. Yeah, but I don't think you can hear this one. So let's forget this one. Let me play the other one. He sent me one where it's Bald and Beautiful theme song featuring Dizzle Wood. It's on my YouTube channel, Salon. Del Racino, baby. All right, now, the one you like the most, guys, I won't disappoint you. The one that we're going to begin. Because you guys, you know how it is. I'm, I'm just the clown. I'm here for you guys to, you know, to be amused, right? I, I know that's why I exist. The one that you all guys love. Here you go. Here he goes. I dedicate this to my boy, Sonny. This is for you, Sonny. Tomorrow my cheat day, or no more, never again, no Saturday, no, oh man, oh, oh man, no, 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 oh man, oh, oh man. Yeah, no salad, man, no, no, man. I don't want salad, no, 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 man. Why like this? Okay, now we're ready. Okay, let's begin. Let's refute Hamza Yusuf. Does the Bible predict Muhammad? Mohammed? May the Holy Spirit give us focus to glorify the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit in Jesus Almighty name. Does the Quran say that Muhammad is in the Bible? Yes. Now, is Muhammad in the Bible? Yes and no. Okay, let's begin where we left off. This is part four. Is Muhammad in the Bible? Yes and no. What do I mean? Yes. Muhammad is in the Bible in that the Bible warns us of antichrist and false prophets. And Muhammad is one of them. But no, Muhammad is in, not in the Bible in that he was announced to come as a prophet in the line of the prophets before him. So glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. We're going to continue where we left off. Now, before I finish, remind me to play a clip. In fact, let's just play it now. A clip from my friend, Jamal Muhammad White. <laughs> Jamal Muhammad White. What's up, Jamal? You guys know Jamal Muhammad White? Anybody know Jamal Muhammad White? All right, hold on. Let's do this. One second. Let's quit this. Let me play this clip. Tell me what you get from this clip. Jamal Muhammad White. And we're going to play Hamza Yusuf. We're going to continue where we left off. The articles related to this session are in the description box. So if you go to the description box, the articles I wrote, particularly for the series, and other articles, re re rebuttals related to the same theme are in the description box. So you have my permission. Take my articles, my sessions, upload them, translate them, clip them, but disseminate them freely. I don't charge you. You don't charge people. Your reward is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me play this clip from him. 
as we about to begin. Tell me what this sounds like, all right? Tell me, he's asked the question about how would you witness to a Muslim when it comes to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So at the one hour, 23 minute mark, look at his response. Now, I'm not going to give you the link because it's not worth listening to. I will listen to it. It was supposed to be a talk on the Trinity and I didn't get anything out of it. Okay. So it is. With a young Muslim family man. Okay. So now this is as loud as it gets. I can't help it. The quality's not that good. So he's asked. He's got a friend, a young Muslim family man. And he wants to witness to him. So how does he witness? Now, listen to his response. Tell me what you get. How would you convince him that Jesus is God? You said a young Muslim man? Yes. Oh, okay. Family man, yes. Well, um, I, I don't want to uh, go too far afield, but I have uh, what I would suggest to you if you haven't had a chance to see it. I had one of the most amazing opportunities that anyone has ever had. In 2014, I stood in the Gray Street Mosque in Durban, South Africa, which at the time was the second largest mosque in the Southern Hemisphere of the world, okay? To defend in debate in front of a huge number of Muslims, the deity of Christ. The man asks him, how would you show a young Muslim family man the deity of Christ? And before he even gets to the answer, what does James White do? Jamal Muhammad White? You saw what he did, right? He goes about reminding you of how great he is, how fantastic he is, how phenomenal he is, and what a gift he is to the church. One more time, watch your it. I don't know why I do this to myself. I listen to this guy, but maybe because I'm a glutton for pain. Sure. Only scripture and all of it. You want you want you want the you want true evidence of what being filled with the spirit is? Okay, listen. Long term consistent obedience to God's word. Watch your this is how not to do apologetics, not to do evangelism. I mean, God save me from my own pride. Okay. You can go home and treat and we don't end up like this. dog afterwards, and it means nothing. Okay, yeah. Oh, preach. Yeah, when preach. you look preach, at someone, Jimmy. Jimmy. Their preach, life Jimmy. Consistently. Okay, so he's going to get to the question. That's the evidence of oh, the yeah. presence of the Spirit. Preach, Jimmy. Jimmy, preach. preach. Now watch. Listen to this. You got that sermon for free there, bro. Yeah. You got the sermon for free there, bro. See, I'm preaching. Put it this way. Okay, before the question, I'd rather have John Betadishu text me all day and call me, and I'd rather be locked in a room and look at him for full 24 hours than hear this man preach a sermon. That's how painful it is to hear this man. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they know how to do this. They have wireless microphones on booms and... <laughs> A lot better than we are. Okay, I'm in contact with a, a young Muslim family man. Listen. How would you convince him that Jesus is God? You said a young Muslim man? Yes. Oh, okay. Family Listen. man, yeah. How would well, you convince him? Um, Listen. I, I don't want to uh, go too far afield, but I have uh, what I would suggest to you if you haven't had a chance to see it. I had one of the most amazing opportunities that anyone has ever had in 2014. I stood in the Gray Street Mosque in Durban, South Africa, which at the time was the second largest mosque in the Southern Hemisphere of the world, okay? To defend in debate in front of a huge number of Muslims, the deity of Christ. And so that's going to give you a much better, a fuller answer than anything I can give you right now. Uh, but just simply to sort of uh, summarize, yeah, okay. yeah. the problem you have in dealing with a very Muslim okay, that's it. is not so much what the... So there you go. 
So spend most of your response talking about how great you are and your great exploits and your great achievements and that you're just great and everyone should recognize your greatness and what a gift you are to the church. And that really helps. Now, let's continue where we left off. If you remember in part three, we thoroughly dismantled the assertion. Exactly, Twinkle. We thoroughly dismantled the assertion that in John 1, 19 to 21, the prophet that the Jews were expecting is Muhammad. You guys with me? Class has begun now. Let's focus. Let the Holy Spirit work through me to help you. And I demonstrated in part three, because I used this post that I published for your benefit. If you go here, here it is. Jesus, the God who Moses wrote about. I demonstrated Jesus, the God who Moses wrote about. I demonstrated that according to the Lord Jesus and his inspired emissaries, his apostles and their followers, Moses and the prophets wrote about Jesus Christ. And I also demonstrated Moses not only wrote about the Lord Jesus Christ, he saw Jesus Christ face to face in person before Jesus became flesh. Now, there are people listening to me who may not understand what do I mean. And we have a lot of brothers and sisters and a lot of Assyrians listening on Facebook. We believe, if you're a Christian, I need you guys to listen now. And this is, again, for the benefit of those who are listening. There are some listening on Facebook whom I grew up with that may not know what the faith is. They've been raised as Christians but may have not been taught the faith fully. So I just want to take a moment to explain. Our belief is, according to the scriptures, the Holy Bible. It's not only history, it's accurate history, but it's inspired history to give us God's word so we can know who God is, what he's like, and what he's done for us. According to the scriptures, the Holy Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, in Assyrian we say, Oreta Ugdata. Those of you listening, Oreta, the Old Testament, Ugdata, New Testament. Jesus Christ, before he was born of the Blessed Virgin, the Holy Virgin, existed before creation with the Father and the Spirit as the Father's Son. So this person that we call Jesus, an Assyrian parsupa person, has no beginning, has no end. He's always existed as the Son of God, one with the Father and the Spirit. And it was this person we call the Son that the Father and the Spirit worked with to create everything in heaven and earth. So Jesus before he became flesh, has always existed as the Son of God, his word, and was the one who created the heavens and the earth, and he gives life to the heavens and the earth, and he's the one who created us and gives us life. And then at a point in time, Jesseel, don't help me. You're not helping me by quoting verses, please. Focus. Then at a point of time, he chose to create the Blessed Virgin, Theotokos, the God-bearer, and chose her to be his mother, and then by the Holy Spirit, his eternal companion, produced in her womb, while she was a virgin, no sex, the physical body, the human nature, that then the Son of God took to himself, so he resided in her womb, became a human baby from her, so he could become a man, and be one with us in nature to save us. This is what we believe. Okay? So this is our teaching according to the revelation of God, the Holy Bible. Anyone who's a Christian must believe that. Uh, David, ask me again so I can send you to James White's church. Ask me one more time, David, because I already don't like you. And I'm going to send you to James White's church so you can ask him. So ask me that question again. Say, wait, what was the point of James White's video? What's the point of you asking me if you don't get the point? So I can send you to James White's church. Anyway. For the rest of you listening and not being a troll like David, our dear brother, who's been here more than once, and I thought he was listening, but now he's trolling. Do you understand? If you're a Christian, that's what you're supposed to believe. That's your teaching. That's why we say, in a certain, Shemit Baba, Buruna, Ruchat Kacha, name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because the three are the one God. What's up, Marcy? I hope you've been watching the streams, even though you've been busy and that you've been blessed and benefited by it. So, before he became flesh from the Blessed Virgin, Jesus always existed as God's Son, as His Word, as a divine person. 
He wasn't always human. Please, guys, listen. Jesus wasn't always a man. He wasn't always a human, but he's always been God. He's always existed as one divine person who then took on a human nature, but he still remained one divine person. Everyone with me there? We need to know this before I move on. Everyone got it? Before I move on, we understand what we're supposed to believe. There's the article. I put it in the description box. We're going to be using that. So everyone got it? Okay, if we got it, the Bible says that before Jesus became flesh, Jesus appeared to Moses. So the God that Moses saw, the God that Moses spoke with, included the Son. And if you go to one of my previous sessions, I actually demonstrated from the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, the Father with the Son and the Holy Spirit all appeared. Father with the Son and the Holy Spirit all appeared. And the angelic host came down to accompany Moses and Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness. Go back and watch that session. So in part three, I showed where we're told Moses not only wrote about Jesus, but he saw Jesus before Jesus became man. Now, with that said, let me show you from Muslim scholars in this article again. Are we ready? If you're now classes beginning, you're going to learn a lot, and you're going to learn a lot about your Bible. Lynn, Lynn, are you upset that no one prays to your mother? Why would anyone pray lying to your mother when she's a, she a whore? Are you jealous that people pray to Mary and love her and honor her and praise her because she's the mother of God, but no one prays to your mother because she's a spiritual whore and she's one of these Shia prostitutes lying? Are you upset about that? Well, sucks being you. and sucks to have your mother as a mother. Take it up with your mother why no one praises her except the Shia in Iran. They praise her for Muta. Anyway, glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Everyone with me there? See, when you dishonor the mother of my Lord and you think you're being pious and spiritual doing God a favor, I'm going to dishonor your mother because your mother is not good enough to even wash the sandals of the Blessed Mother. And she's a creature, no more, no less, not a goddess. The greatest of all creatures that Jesus created, just like Paul is a creature, but none of us would be good enough to carry Paul's sandals even though he's just a man and in comparison to Christ, he's a maggot. You wish, you wish your mother was honored and blessed like the Blessed Mother. Don't be upset at us that she was a Shia prostitute, your mother in Iran, and you're not taking that on on us. Ain't I a stinker, guys? Don't you love me? They think they're going to come here and sound pious and spiritual and think they're doing Jesus a favor by denigrating the Blessed Mother and slandering Catholics and Orthodox as if they worship her as a goddess. May God... Crush your mouths and chase and rebuke you and shame you for that lie and slander. No Orthodox, no Catholic who knows his or her faith thinks that Mary is a goddess. They know she's a creature. And without Jesus, she's nothing. And Jesus created her and owns her and was pleased to make her his mother. And they honor her as such. Like she said in Luke 1, 46 to 55, all generations will call me blessed. Okay. Everyone with me there? Luke 1, 46, 55. Go and read your Bible. Pretend you know your Bible because you don't know the Bible and you don't know Jesus, though you think you're doing God a favor. So, so everyone with me there? All right. Sorry, guys. I have to clean house. That's why you love me. I'm not politically correct. I'm not as funny as Sonny making that money and he's sweet as honey, but I'm close. All right. Now, if you're listening, let's continue. Christiana, if you have a sincere questions, I'll give you the link in a minute. But let me finish this point. Now, let me show you from, let me show you from the same article. Do you know that there are Muslims who admit what the New Testament already stated? And we don't need Muslims' testimony because the Quran is trash. Muhammad is an antichrist. All of the Quran is a false god. But because we're debating Muslims, we're going to use their own sources against them to bury their lies and show that Jesus is God and Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus. Use their own sources against them. Are you aware that there are Muslims who admit that Muhammad confirmed that Moses wrote about Jesus? Can I quote those so we can finish John 1, 19 
to 21 and go into other verses that Hamza Yusuf butchered to a shame and humiliation and show you how not to interpret the Bible and how to interpret the Bible and understand the depth of Scripture and how it applies to you? I met some stupid people, but Assad, you give Muhammad a run for his money. I don't know how many times I can say, right, before he became flesh. But anyway, are we ready now? Yeah, uh, Hilda. Here, let, ask me this question, Hilda. Are you a Syrian, Hilda? See now, they're coming as women. Have you noticed that now? These Mohammedan trolls, these sons of the devil, they're now pretending to be women. Christiana and Hilda coming under fake nicks, pretending to be women, thinking that that's somehow going to make me less likely to humiliate them. All right, now, let's see what the Muslim scholars stated. Did Moses write about Jesus? Let's go. You guys ready? So we can continue and finish off. Here it is. It's in my section. That article, you're going to find this subsection. It says Muslim scholars. Okay? Muslim scholars, right? So let's, let's begin. Do the Muslim scholars agree with God's true word? Moses wrote about Jesus. Yes, the citations are there. Here's the first reference. Are we ready? Now, as you see, Christina, she just gave it away. I'm a woman, not a Muslim. I didn't know that Islam was a gender. Now, guys, Christina just taught us there's more than two genders. There's women, men, and Muslim. See what she said? I'm a woman, not Muslim. Gee, I didn't know that if you're a Muslim, that means you're not a woman. <laughs> Oh. oh, only in my channel, man. Only in my channel do I get such people, man. Did you see that? I'm a woman, not a Muslim. And then she goes, lol. She's laughing at me like I'm stupid. Wait, hmm. Oh, so if you're Muslim, you're not a woman? So there are no women who are Muslim? Oh, so now there are three genders, male, female, and Muslim. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, all right, that was good. Woo, that was good, man. All right, let's let's begin. Let's begin. That was a good one. Here I'm quoting from all right, Mahmoud M. Ayub. Okay, Mahmoud M. Ayub, and he's going to quote one of the greatest Muslim scholars and commentators of the Quran, Ar Razi, a Persian scholar. And his exposition of chapter 3, verse 50. And so I give you the reference. The Quran and its interpreters, the House of Imran, volume 2, page 150. Commenting on chapter 3, verse 50, Ar-Razi says that the Torah mentioned the coming of Jesus. So I quote. All right, here you go. Here it is. So this Muslim scholar says, the Torah prophesied the coming of Jesus. So then he asked the Muslims, where in the Torah was Jesus prophesied? You ready? Let's do it again. Sorry, I missed an R. Oh, boy. Here we go. Let's begin, guys. Razi, however, holds that there is actually no contradiction. Jesus confirms the Torah but abrogates it. Isn't that a contradiction? No, there isn't. Between the two statements, because confirming the Torah can only signify the belief that all that is in it is true and right. So Jesus confirmed that the Torah in his hand, entirely true, accurate, uncorrupt, everything in it is right. So he confirmed the Torah that I have access to, everything in it is true. It's God's word, perfectly preserved. Even though I'm going to now loose you from some of its commands. If moreover, now this is what the Razi is saying. The second purpose of Jesus' apostleship is not mentioned in the Torah. The Torah did not say that Jesus would come, the Messiah, and abrogate the Torah. Is making lawful some of the things which are unlawful, right? It still will not contradict his having confirmed the Torah. Now, what? look what he says. Pay attention because I had explained this. Furthermore, yeah. since the Torah contains prophecies concerning the coming of Jesus, then neither his coming nor his law would be contrary to the Torah. You see what Razi is saying? You understand Razi's reasoning? Number one, this Muslim commentator admits the Torah contains prophecies of the coming of Jesus. Number two, he admits that the Quran testifies in chapter 3, verse 50, Jesus 
confirmed the Torah between his hands, testifying the Torah that he read and the Jews had. All of it was true. None of it was corrupt. So now Muslims, you're in a dilemma. The Torah predicts the coming of Jesus and Jesus confirms the Torah as being uncorrupted. And the only Torah that Jesus had access to is what we read today because we have copies like the Dead Sea Scrolls that give us an idea of what the Old Testament was like that Jesus confirmed. So if your Quran is true, Jesus confirmed the Old Testament I read today. And that Old Testament, specifically the Torah, predicts Jesus is coming. Do you see what Razi is doing? Razi is making our case for us. Razi is admitting that chapter 3, verse 50 of the Quran says that Jesus confirmed the Torah between his hands. Whatever Torah the Jews had, whatever copies of the Old Testament they produced and were reading, Jesus confirmed those copies to be accurate copies of the Torah, and the Torah is uncorrupt. You with me there, guys, before I move on? You understand how powerful this is? From a renowned Muslim expositor, Erazi. Okay, it's in my article, the citation. But then Razi also admits that the Torah contains prophecies of Jesus. Now, can I ask you a question? Let me ask you a question. Where are these prophecies of Jesus in the Torah? Christina, I'll get back to you later. Don't go anywhere. I'll open up the Q&A. Where are the prophecies of Jesus in the Torah? Where? Right here, in case you missed it, there it goes, right on the screen. Since the Torah contains prophecies concerning the coming of Jesus. And if you missed the first part, here's the first part, what Razi said, right? Jesus, according to chapter 3, verse 50 of the Quran, right? Confirming the Torah can only signify the belief, Jesus' belief, that all that is in it is true and right. Are we getting it, guys? Now, Razi isn't the only one. Let me give you some more. Kenny, I'm not asking you to answer. You want the Muslims to answer. Let me give you some more references from Muslim scholars. Okay, that was Razi. Here we have another one. This comes from the Tafsir al Jalalain, the commentary of the two Jalals on chapter 2, verse 113. At the time of Muhammad, the Jews were saying to the Christians, you have nothing to stand upon. And the Christians saying to the Jews, you have nothing to stand upon. And the Jews rejected Jesus and the Christians out of spite rejected Moses. So the Quran comes to rebuke them. The English translation of Tafsir al Jalalain, the commentary of the two Jalals on chapter 2, verse 113. Here's how they explain it. Okay. Here's how they explain it. It's in my article. Look what it says here. Okay. Watch here. Let me quote it. And you'll see. All right. Here you go. Right here. I'm not going to read all of it, but the relevant part. Okay. Here you go. Chapter 2, verse 113. Watch here, guys. Give me a second as it comes up. The Jews say. See, I knew it. It's a guy pretending to be a girl. Sarah, I'm about to block you. The Jews say, right, the Christians stand on nothing that can be used as support for their claims, and they rejected Jesus. And the Christians say, the Jews stand on nothing that can be used as support for their claims, and they rejected Moses. Now watch the response. Yet they, both groups, both of them recite the scripture. They read the same book, the Bible, revealed to them. In the scripture of the Jews, there is the confirmation of Jesus. Wait. The scriptures of the Jews, like the Torah, confirms Jesus. And in that of the Christians, the scriptures of the Christians, there's confirmation of Moses. So again, I'm asking, if the Quran is right, if the Quran is right, the scriptures of the Jews, the Torah, confirms Jesus, sent by God. Where in the Torah... Where in the scriptures of the Jews do you find the confirmation of Jesus? Are we listening? Guys, please don't be distracted. Focus. You're distracted. You won't learn and grow. Where, Muslims? Where? 
See? Please preserve us. Rebuke Satan in Jesus' name. Yeah, I don't spill. Please, my God. Well, so All right. Here's another one. Another exposition. This comes from Tafsir Ibn Kathir, which you can read online on chapter 2, verse 113. Look what he says. Okay? So we can move on to other things. And these things you're going to learn. The true meaning of the prophecies of the Old Testament, how they point to our Lord. We're going to go into meat. It's not just refuting Muhammad. It's glorifying Christ, our Lord. Here is Ibn Kathir's exposition of chapter 2, verse 113. Watch here. Quote. There you go. Okay, watch here. Look at this, guys. Read with me, please. Ibn Kathir, hope. Stuff that the Dean show and Hamza Yusuf did not tell you. Allah made it clear that each party, may the Lord Jesus be glorified, increase our numbers for his praise, read the affirmation of what they claim to reject in their book. Look, what, what it means is that the Jews have the Old Testament that confirms Jesus. And the Christians have their scriptures that confirms Moses, even though they deny each other. Consequently, watch, the Jews disbelieve in Jesus, even though they have the Torah in which Allah took their covenant by the tongue of Moses to believe in Jesus. Busted, burial, annihilation. Moses in the Torah bound the Jews to believe in Jesus. Moses was told by God to bind the Jews, to make a covenant with me, to believe in Jesus when he comes. Right? By the tongue of Moses, the Jews were bid to believe in Jesus as part of the covenant. Where did Moses mention Jesus? Also, the gospel contains Jesus' assertion that Moses' prophet in the Torah came from Allah. Yeah, we believe that. It's in our gospel, not Allah of the Quran. Right? Yet each party disbelieved in what the other party had. All right. Well, does Ibn Kathir have more to say? Here's Ibn Kathir on chapter 61, verse 6 of the Quran. Chapter 61, verse 6. Here you go. I hope you guys are not going to sleep. I got a late nighter. Asa, the counterfeit Jesus of Islam, said, The Torah conveyed the glad tidings of my coming. What? Ibn Kathir explains, chapter 61, verse 6, where the Quran has Isa saying, I confirm the Torah between my hands. Hilda, keep hoping, and I'm going to block you. Abraham, Sarah, Hilda. In fact, here, let me expose you right now, after this. The Torah conveyed the glad tidings of my coming. And my coming confirms the truth of the Torah. You see what it's saying here? Ibn Kathir saying 6116 is basically affirming the Torah predicted the coming of Jesus. And when Jesus came, he proved the Torah is true. Because if Jesus didn't come, then he would falsify the Torah. Okay? I convey the glad tidings of the prophet who come after me. He is the unlettered, right? Meccan, Arab prophet, and messenger Ahmed. Yeah, right. Okay, do you understand what you just read? What do you want? What do you want? There you go. It's that fake, Hilda. Hilda, I know you are that fake demonized bastard, so I'm calling you right now. Pick up Abraham, Sarah, Hilda, Sarah, so I can block you right now. Hold on. You don't pick up, you're going to get blocked. And I'm going to send the she after you and your mommy. Hold on, it's that demon, Hilda. Now here she's Hilda. Over here she's Sarah. Abraham, Sarah. See, I knew it. You're that stupid bastard pretending to be a whore. Hey, can you tell me something? Uh, how many she have slept with your mother? Yeah, that's what I thought. See, I told you. See, Hilda? You dumb little Shia prostitute. Get her out of here. You dumb little Shia prostitute. Now, Christina, you're next. See, it's a guy pretending to be a girl. Stupid, dumb bastards. Now they're girls because Muhammad used to dress in Aisha's <clears throat> clothing. He used to wear Aisha's dress. Yep. 
So now coming back to the issue. Hope and everyone else, did you see that according to the Muslims like Ibn Kathir, chapter 61, verse 6 of the Quran and 350 of the Quran and 2113 of the Quran confirm that Moses prophesied Jesus in the Torah and bound the Israelites to believe in Jesus when he comes to confirm the Torah is true in that he fulfilled what the Torah said about Jesus is coming. Did you get it? Because I got one more and then we're going to go into other alleged prophecies of Muhammad. Did you get that? Everyone? Everyone got it? All right. Now, the final one from Ibn Kathir. Final one. This comes from the Sira of Prophet of Muhammad, abridged by Muhammad Ali al Halabi al Athari. Part 2, page two, page 24. This is also Ibn Kathir. al Sira al Nabawiya. Qisas al Anbiya. The English translation. And then we're going to go into it. Now, these other ones are going to excite you because you're going to learn more about Old Testament prophecy and how Jesus our Lord fulfills them. The Sirah of Prophet of Muhammad, abridged by Muhammad Ali al Halabi, translating Ibn Kathir's work. Part 2, page 24. Look what Ibn Kathir said. Get ready, guys. This is Ibn Kathir. Watch here. Look what he says about Jesus being like Musa, alayhi salam. Isa and Musa. All right. Ready? In book 4 of the existing Torah, he meant book 5. He made a mistake. So this is Ibn Kathir. In book 4, he meant book 5. The five books of Moses saying, but in the fourth book, because he couldn't count like Muhammad couldn't count. There is a verse which says a prophet was set forth for them from their close relations and brothers like you, Musa, and I'll put my word in his mouth. You see, Ibn Kathir is alluding to Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 19. Now he made a mistake. He said the fourth book, which he meant the fifth book. Follow me. But now notice what he says about Deuteronomy 18, 18, and 19. It is clear to them and to everyone that Allah did not send a prophet from the offspring of Ismail except Muhammad. Now watch this. In fact, in fact, there was no prophet from the children of Israel similar to Musa except Isa. Boom! He hung himself. No prophet among the Israelite prophets was like Moses except Jesus. He admits it. But the Jews do not accept his prophethood. And he's not the offspring of their brothers. So in his stupidity, he thinks a prophet from your brothers means from another nation outside of Israel. But he just admitted Jesus is like Moses and no other prophet among Israel is like Moses except Jesus. But still, he's not the prophet like Moses. Because the prophet won't be from Israel, but from their brothers, which means he doesn't understand biblical language. So then who is it? Let's see what else he says. Oh, well, guess who it is then? And I'm going to post that again. Here you go. But the Jews do not accept his prophet, and he's not the offspring of their brothers. Instead, he is related to them through his mother. Therefore, the meaning of the above verses focuses on prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad, right? So, wait. Jesus is like Moses and no other Israelite prophet, but he's not from their brothers because he means a nation outside of Israel. That's how even Kathir is understanding it. But if it means Israel, then Jesus is like Moses. But since it's referring to a prophet who's not an Israelite, it's got to be Muhammad. So notice, he admits Jesus is like Moses and the only Israelite prophet who is like Moses. But still, it's not about Jesus because from among their brethren means someone outside of the nation. Yeah, right. And I'm going to destroy that argument that Muhammad is a son of Abraham through Ishmael and therefore related to the nation. I'm going to get there because we're going to do about six, seven, eight parts. Thoroughly dismantling Hamza Yusuf and his lies and his master, Ali Atai, as Bible butchers. That we now see. That even Muslim scholarship admitted, Ar-Razi, Ibn Kathir, the two Jalals, right? 
and a plethora of other Muslims, that Mo Moses in the Torah prophesied the coming of Jesus and bound the Israelites to a covenant to believe in Jesus when he shows up. Was that clear? So I can move on to the other prophecies. Now that we got that out of the way, if you're not getting it, I can't move on. If you're getting it, I can move on. All right? So, everyone got it? So let's go to the other one. Let's see. Okay, we did John 1. We did Matthew 21. Let's do Shiloh. 48 minute mark. You ready? This now, you're going to learn your Bible. You're going to learn your Bible more in depth to know what these prophecies mean and do not mean. And here's the article we're going to be using for this one. Okay, here you go. I'm not going to play the clip where he quotes Genesis 49, verse 10, where Jacob prophesied that Shiloh, Shiloh will come as Jacob prophesied about Judah. Here's the post that goes with this, all right? Are you not ready to hear from Hunza Yusuf butchering Genesis 49, 10? The prophecy of Shiloh, we pronounce it Shiloh. You guys ready for me? You ready? Night is young for me. You ready? All right. Christiana, since you have questions, I want you to Skype me so I can test out to see if you're another man pretending to be a woman. So here's my Skype. Okay, now let's play from the 40. Let me double check the time again. 48 minute mark. Listen to what he's going to say. If you want to see why they are wicked and dishonest and, dishonest and deceitful and do not deserve any respect because they're truly of the devil, their father who's a liar and a deceiver and a pervert, watch how he will allude to rabbis but never quote them in context because he's like his father, the devil, Muhammad's father, a liar and a deceiver and antichrist. Watch. 48-minute mark. What does he say about Genesis 40? 9, verse 10, the prophecy of Shiloh. Man, I can't see. Man, this is rough. Hold on, guys. Shiloh. Sorry, guys. I have to find. Oh, that's right. Okay. One second. We're right there. Shiloh. Here goes Shiloh. You ready? Okay, we ready? Let's go here. Okay, here you go. Islams, uh, because Islam I'm starting around the 48-minute mark. Yep, Christina is a troll because Christina tried to call me and she's blocked. So it's a guy pretending to be a woman. I'm going to get the Shia to do to you what they, they did to your mother, Christina. All the previous dispensations are forms of Islam. Listen. So in this thing that where he tells him the scepter will not depart from Judah. Listen. The Prophet Sallallahu said, that I am al-hashar. Yuhshar al-nasu ala qadmi wa ana al-aqib. That all the nations will be gathered at my feet and I am the final. So this, in in Hebrew, it's called, it says, Ad ki yavo shilo. Okay, understand. Genesis 49 verses 8 to 12. Before Jacob dies, he prophesied over his 12 sons. This is a prophecy about Judah where he says, the ruler's staff will not depart from G Judah until Shiloh comes or Shiloh comes. And now he's going to tell you what the word Shiloh or Shiloh means. It means the nations will be gathered to him. And he quotes the hadith where Muhammad says, they'll all be gathered to me on the day of judgment. Now watch the butchering of this passage. Shiloh, there's a lot of debate about what Shiloh means. But what Shiloh means until he whose right it is comes. So Rashi, one of the great... Uh, uh, commentators uh, from the rabbinical tradition says that Shiloh is both she praise Listen. and lo to him. Praise to him. The praise until the praised one comes. Ibn Ezra quotes Ankalos who rendered Shiloh as simply his. In the Arabic translation of the Torah, Shiloh is written Shilun and translated as Alladhi huwa lahu. Shilahu, Shiloh. The one to whom it belongs. So Listen. what is it that belongs to him? Watch here. 
Strong's concordance says that the word that's used, yakaha, for obey and translated as obey, is actually translated in the New Test, in the King James Version, as unto him shall be the gathering of all people. In other words, yuhsharun nas ala qadami. So this is in the, the Genesis, the Prophet ﷺ, we believe that this is speak, that Shiloh is our Prophet ﷺ. Do you understand? So the word Shiloh, he, and it belongs. And then King James renders it that this is the one to whom the nations belong, who gather the nations to himself and they'll praise him. That's what he's saying, right? And now he's going to refer to Hadith where on the Day of Judgment, the nations will be gathered to Muhammad so that Muhammad can intercede for them. So understand what he's saying. And he mentioned Targum Ankelos and Rashi and how they explain the word Shiloh. Please pay attention. Everything that I'm going to quote is in that article that I'm going to share with you one more time. Listen. And we're going to go into meat. And that the scepter will go from Judah when Shiloh comes. So the, the, Jesus was from uh, Judah. David was from Judah. All of them, the Abrahamic lineage, they're all from Judah. And so it will go after Jesus, it will go to our Prophet. Notice now. that. But why does it say, Aladi huwa lahu? What is it that's for him? See, what does it mean that it's for him? Let me first stop there because he's going to quote the hadith that for him means intercession will be for him. The intercession will be for him. Okay? But let me first now show you. What did Rashi say? Yes? Hello? Hello? Oh, it's you, so you're not fake. Uh, no, I'm not fake. Okay, I'll give you the link to my stream area right after this. You can then come on stream here. I just want to test you out. So you passed the test. Okay. All right, good. God bless you. Okay, she's kosher, man. Christina, you're kosher. It doesn't help that you sound like Mariah Carey when you speak. Don't try to tempt us, sister. It's not going to work. But anyway, kidding. Okay, now you guys ready? All right. We ready for meat? Yeah. Sorry, Christina. Yeah, she's kosher. Okay, she turned out to be kosher. My bad. Yeah. Lord have mercy on us. Ladies, please. May the Lord Jesus give us perfect self-control for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh-oh. Anna Christian. What happened? Hey, what do you want? Why are you calling? Okay, we now we got two people, two people claiming to be Christina. Okay, you you both passed the test. All right. Okay, I'll I'll send you the link later. You just got unblocked. Don't worry about it. You just got unblocked. Oh, okay, thank you for that. And I'll have, send you the link on Streamyard to come on and ask your question. Okay. 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 God bless you. Now we got two two women calling. The other one wasn't Christina. Ladies, what are you doing here? What what's going on here? What's going on? What's up with you guys, man? Dude. Man, guys, pray. Ask the Lord to rebuke these distractions. Okay, there she goes. That's the real Christina. She just called me. I'll give you the link in a minute. The other one was Mariah Carey's twin. Oh, so there's two of them. Okay, I see. All right, Sarah. All right, Sarah. Okay. Sarah, are you on my stream? We got two. We got a Christina and a Sarah. All right. I guess Sarah wasn't lying either. This is the real Sarah. K Sarah, K Sarah. Now, Sarah, did you want to ask me questions like Christina so I can give you the link? Comment or do we block you? I'll never finish these sessions before the rapture. Yeah. Let me see. Hold on. Okay. One second. Let me see this. One second, guys. All right. One second. Sorry, guys. Hello? Yeah. Okay, Sarah. Were you in my chat and my comments? And uh, YouTube? No. Okay, because I'm live right now. I thought you're the one who was trying to ask me questions. Oh. So, you, um... so how did you find my Skype number? I thought you were the one in the, my account. Because I'm doing a live stream right now on YouTube. 
And I thought you were one of the ladies that wanted questions. Were, are you one of them? No, I didn't ask anything really. Okay, but yes, I mean. Okay, so or okay, well, so, but you didn't get blocked, did you? On my account, YouTube, they didn't block you. No. Okay, okay. Then comment on. Okay, you hang up on the you, Skype and comment in the YouTube and let us know you're not blocked. All right? Okay, I'm going to hang up right now. I'm live because I confuse you with the other sister. So now on my YouTube, in the comments, say, I'm here. That's me. So I'll give you the stream yard so you come up and ask questions. So I just wanted to check because now I got confused and I appreciate the confusion. Okay. Say hi to Mariah Carey, okay? Okay. Right. Okay, bye-bye. All right, she's guys. She's gonna say hi to Mar Mariah Carey. This is Mar Mariah Carey's uh, twin sister. All right, can we begin now? All right, please have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, sister. Please, Lord Jesus, save us from distractions. Rebuke Satan so we can focus. I'll never finish any series before I see my grandchildren. By the time I finish these series, I'll see my grandchildren, unless the rapture happens. Okay, can we now focus, guys? Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Okay, can we now focus, guys? All right, let me explain Genesis 49, 8 to 12. We ready? You're now going to learn a lot. There's the link to the article where I quote Rashi, Targum, Targum Ankelos. I quote them right there, the article. Did you remember what he said? He said Rashi explained Shiloh this way. Targum Ankalos explained Shiloh this way, but guess what he didn't tell you? He didn't tell you who Shiloh was according to Rashi, this renowned medieval rabbi who was an anti-Christian polemicist, who Shiloh was or Shiloh was according to the Targum Ankelos. He didn't tell you who they were. Okay, there is Sarah. Okay, Sarah, God bless you. That's the sister that called me. So Christiana and Sarah, I'll give you the link later. Just wait. Let's finish. Now, are you ready? To now quote what he didn't quote, because he's trying to tell you Genesis 49, verses 8 to 12, when Jacob prophesied over Judah, he goes, Judah will have the ruler's staff remain in his line, meaning the kings will come from the line of Judah. And that happened when David from Judah was appointed king. And the ruler's staff won't depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. And to him will be the obedience of the nation. Sarah, you don't need to call me, sister. We just saw you in the comment section. Sarah G, we got it. You don't need to call me. You can stop so I can finish the point. A lot of snack bar, a lot of snack bar. Let's see if she's hearing me. Sarah, you don't need to call. Just listen. I'll get back to you later. She keeps calling. Okay, you guys understood what the point is? I just said, stop calling, Sarah. You're about to get blocked, Sarah. Stop calling. I'm in the middle of a stream, Sarah. I know you're listening. You got it, Sarah? You're going to stop calling now? All right. It is her. That was the same one. It's her. It was her. Yeah, it's her. Why is she calling me? I just talked to you. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, Sarah, can you stop distracting me so I can focus? All right, brother, are we ready? Are we ready now? Satan hates us. That's why it distracts us. But the blood of Jesus Christ cover us against Satan. Okay, now, are we ready? Here we go again. Why are you calling me, Sarah? Why are you calling me? What do you mean? You told me to call you back after I called No, you. I didn't say call me so back. I said, back. I said, go to my YouTube, listen, and when I'm done, I'll send you the stream yard for the love of Allah and his snack bar. Can you not call because I'm in the middle of a live stream? Go listen. When I'm done, I'll give you the stream yard. <sighs> pins and needles, needles and pins. Okay, so are you going to stop calling? Are you going to watch now on YouTube? No, but I have some questions. 
No, you don't ask now before I send you to Mecca. Go to my YouTube, watch the live stream. We got it now? We got it, Sarah, or I got to block you? Which is it? What did I do? Just being a woman is good enough. Ask Muhammad. He said women are deficient in intelligence. That's why most of you will be in hell. So go to my YouTube channel. Don't call me right now. Bye-bye. I'll block you if you call. I'm telling you. She goes, what did I do? She thinks because she has a voice like Mariah Carey, I'm going to melt. Ew, what did I do? Well, Muhammad said you're a woman and you're less intelligent than a man. And that's why most of you will be in hell. What did I do? Oh, you, Sammy, I'm going to make you melt because my voice is sultry. Are you melting? Ooh, you're melting like butter? No. Been there, done that, L for love. That's why I ended up divorced. Fool me once, shame on me. Or shame on you, I should say. Fool me twice, shame on me. Ask John Bedadishu how many times he got fooled. She thinks that her... What did I do? Are you melting, Sammy? You melting? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, retarded. That's why I'm divorced and homeless. Why kids in another state... Because I fell for that one time. Ain't happening a second time. What did I do, Sammy? Please. I'm sure my voice is melting, you big boy. I think you're melting. All right. Anyway, are we ready now? Right. Are we ready, Kiri Laysun? You guys ready? All right. Do we get Genesis 49, 8 to 12? Did we get join? Yeah, logo stales. Genesis 49, 8 to 12. Jacob prophesied that rulers will come from Judah's line until Shiloh, Shiloh comes, and the obedience of the nations will be to him. He's trying to tell you Shiloh means he who is praised and to whom belongs the gathering of the nations, and that's Muhammad, the praised one. Okay. And then he referenced, you remember, right? I don't need to play it again. Rashi and Targum Ankelos, right? You remember he mentioned them? You start at the 48-minute mark. So I don't need to play it again. You heard it, right? Because now I'm going to show you what this deceiver did not quote. We ready now? We ready? If you go to that article, you're going to find, right, this section. Genesis 49.10. Shiloh has come. Look what he did not quote. Guys, look what he did not quote from the very rabbinic references that he alluded to. Here it is. Rashi's commentary in Genesis 49, 10. Online for free in English. Online for free in English. Okay, here it is. Chabad.org, the complete Jewish Bible with Rashi commentary. Rashi, who is Shiloh? Rashi, who is Shiloh? Here you go. Guys, let's see who Shiloh is according to Rashi. You ready? Rashi, who is Shiloh? Until Shiloh comes, this refers to the King Messiah. You mean the very Rashi he quoted? To explain what the word Shiloh means, stated that Shiloh is Messiah. Shiloh refers to the King Messiah to whom the kingdom belongs. And remember he said Targum Ankelos, that Aramaic paraphrase of Genesis 49 done by Ankelos, renders it until the Messiah comes. To whom the kingdom belongs. What else did Rashi say? According to the Midrash Agada, Shiloh is a combination of those Hebrew words, a gift to him. As it is said, they will bring a gift to him who's to be feared. Why didn't he quote that? And then he goes on to say, To him will be the gathering of the nation. Now watch. Look what he says. Watch here. This is Rashi. Look what Rashi says. This too is a noun 
meaning a gathering of peoples, meaning a number of nations who unite to serve God and join under the banner of the King Messiah. The nations will be gathered under the banner of King Messiah. As it is said, to him shall the nations inquire, Isaiah 11.10. All right, that was Rashi. Any other Jew? Here is Targum Ankelos. Targum Ankelos. You remember he mentioned the Targum Ankelos? Here it is online, translated in English. The very Targum he mentioned, translated in English, free of charge. Guys, let's see what this Targum says. Who is Shiloh? Shiloh. Oh, you know. Here you go. Watch here. Here you go. Who is Shiloh? Targum Ankelos. Who is Shiloh? Okay, watch here. He who exerciseth dominion shall not pass away from the house of Yehuda, nor the Sethra from his children children forever, until the Mashiach come, whose is the kingdom, and unto whom shall be the obedience of the nations, or whom the peoples shall obey. Wait, Targum Ankelos, who is Shiloh? Who is Shiloh? Mashiach, Messiah, Mashiach. You see it? Why didn't he quote that? Guys, why didn't he quote that? Can anyone tell me why didn't he quote that? Why did he allude to what these sources say, but never quoted them in context? Because Rashi and Ankelo state, the Shiloh is Messiah. So Judah will not fail to have a ruler until Messiah comes, and the rulership will belong to him. And Messiah has come. And when he came... That's why the Jews no longer have any rulers because Jesus has come. Okay, but wait. This is not the only source. What about Targum Pseudo-Jonathan? Another Aramaic paraphrase of Genesis 49.10. Here it is, the link in my article, but you can read it online, the translation. Here you go. Here you go. You see why God put in my heart to do this? You see it, right? But now what does Targum Pseudo-Jonathan say? All right, watch here. Here you go. Why didn't he quote this? Hmm. Why didn't he quote this? Here you go. Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, another Jewish paraphrase of Genesis into Aramaic. Kings shall not cease from the house of Yehuda, nor Saferim teaching the law from his children until the time that King Mashiach come. Until Melech Mashiach in Hebrew or in Aramaic, Melchem Shicha, the King Messiah shall come, whose is the kingdom, and to whom all the kingdoms of the earth shall be obedient. How beauteous, beatuous is the King Mashiach. How beautiful is King Messiah, who is to rise from the house of Yehuda. Why didn't he quote that? You guys appreciating this? You guys enjoying this? You're learning? May the Holy Spirit give me perfect self-control over my flesh and appetites and be perfectly disciplined. I got to watch this because it got dirty. Hold on. Yeah, I know she's about to. I got more. There's a lot more. I'm not done. And Christina, wait. I'm going to give you the link if you have questions. And, uh, Sarah. Sarah, if you are a troll sent by your husband, the Muslim, I'm going to make Aisha cry as Muhammad did and make you cry and your husband cry for hiding behind you. Okay, but wait, we got more. We ready? Sorry, guys, I have to clean it up. I hope it's better now. Okay, we ready? There's more citation. Now, guys, these are Jewish sources written by unbelieving Jews or Jews writing before Jesus. They are not Christians. They are not Christians. Alex, pay attention before I block you. Don't chat here. Focus. They are Jews. And they're admitting Genesis 49, 8 to 12 is a reference to Messiah being Shiloh. Here's another Targum. Targum Neophyti, pages 219-21, in the Aramaic Bible, translated with apparatus notes by Martin McNamara. McNamara, it's all in my paper for free. What does this Aramaic Targum say about Shiloh, Shiloh? Who is it? Let's see. Okay. Let's see what it is. Okay. All right. Here he goes. Let's see. Hmm. 
You get it right here. Let's check it out. Right here. Another Jewish paraphrase of Genesis into Aramaic done by Jews who are not Christians. Some writing before Christ and after Christ. Here you go, guys. Kings shall not cease from among those of the house of Judah, and neither shall scribes teaching the law from his son's sons until the king Messiah shall come. To whom the kingship belongs, to him shall all the kingdoms be subject. How beautiful is King Messiah, who is to rise from among those of the house of Judah. All right? Now look what it says later on, right here, just this part. And I got still more. Uh, Irfan, who says I want to talk to you? Does she want to talk to you? How beautiful are the eyes of King Messiah, more than pure wine, lest he see with them the revealing of nakedness or the shedding of innocent blood. Or fine, you're going to have to call me in Skype so I can see if you're a troll. If you are, bring the Shia on your mother. All right. So are we catching it? All right. Do we got more sources? Do we got more sources? All right. Let's see. Now there's a note. There's a note from McNamara. Look what he says in this note. Look here. This is his note, the translator. His footnote, guys. Pay attention. Read with me. The footnote, not only three Targums, but Rashi agrees. A lot of the snack bar, three Targums and Rashi. Rashi, the same Rashi that Hamza Yusuf mentioned, and Targum Ankelos. Here's the footnote by McNamara. Until the time King Messiah comes, the kingship, which could be understood at its face value in later Judaism in different ways, until Shiloh comes, or until Shiloh, right? comes or until he comes to Shiloh or until he comes to whom it belongs, Shiloh. The original reading and meaning of the text are quite uncertain. In the paraphrase, Shiloh is first interpreted as a person. So Shiloh is the name of King Messiah. And then through later Hebrew, Shiloh, whose it is, i.e. the Messiah, to whom kingship belongs, the direct messianic interpretation is found in all the Targums. Every Aramaic paraphrase says, Shiloh is either the name of Messiah or Messiah is the one to whom the nations belong, however you want to interpret it. Ankalos, Palestinian Targum, Pseudo-Jonathan, and already in 4Q, Pater, this is Qumran, K4, they found a scroll that interpreted Genesis 49.10 about Messiah, even the Dead Sea Scrolls, until the Messiah of justice, the sprout of David comes, for to him and to his seed, has been given the covenant of kingship. Okay? Also, the works referred to in previous notes, the messianic interpretation of Shiloh has also been constant in rabbinic Judaism. This alludes to the royal Messiah, right? Did you catch it? Do you see what he says? The Dead Sea Scrolls. Talmud. The Talmud. All the Aramaic Targums, Rashi, all admit Shiloh is Messiah. Why didn't Hamza Yusuf tell you this? Why do you think he didn't mention this? It's all in my paper. Yeah, Sarah's a dirty little whore. She's a dirty little whore. She's a here being a whore of the Shia. No, Shiloh doesn't mean take possession. It means a variety of things, Christian King. Don't let me block you. Because you just read what they said. So don't think you know Hebrew more than them before I block you. Sarah, get out of here because it's obviously you're one of these Shia whore that want attention because you're barking. So I guess your husband is less man than Aisha, so he's having you fight for him. All right? Hey, Mark, it's me, Sam. I miss me too. Everyone got it? We got it now? The very Rashi and Targum Ankelos that Hamza alluded to say it's Messiah. Shiloh's Messiah. Targum Pseudo-Jonathan. The Palestinian Targums. 
Targum Neophyti, Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Talmud all say Shiloh is Messiah. Why didn't he tell you that? And all of these references are in this article. In the article. Okay, let me deal with this dumb bastard too. Another dumb bastard. Okay. This dumb bastard pretending to be a Christian. Pick up, you dumb bastard. You Mohammedan prostitute claiming to be a Christian. Christian king. Queer bait. Pick up so I can deal with you too. Filthy dog. Stupid dumb dog. That's what I thought. Okay, another dumb, stupid dog. Christian queer bait. That's good you didn't pick up, you stupid little bastard. Anyway. All right, there you go. They won't stop manifesting, but that's okay. As long as you guys are still learning, let me deal with the demons. Everyone got it? Now, what does it tell you of a guy who started Zaytun Institute, the first Muslim college, which is in Berkeley, Illinois, considered a scholar, and his partner in idolatry and stone licking, another vile, lying, pagan, Mohammedan, Ali Atai, that they would deceive the thousands listening to them, not telling them that Rashi, Targum, Ankelos, the Talmud, all the Targums, and the Dead Sea Scrolls identify Shiloh as the King Messiah, whom they agree is Jesus. Why didn't they tell their audience that? It's okay, brother. I'm all right, Brandon. The Lord Jesus is with us, and he'll constrain me to glorify him. Don't worry. Let me deal with the demons as long as you guys are learning, as long as you're still benefiting. And you get the article where I give you all these references. Here it is. Why didn't he tell you that? Okay, are we ready now to hear the rest of his spiel? Now, by the way, since I want the Holy Spirit to work through me and use me to bless you and strengthen you, are these series benefiting you? Are you learning and understanding how even the Jews understood these Old Testament texts, agreeing with your interpretation? When Jews who don't believe in Jesus agree these passages are about Messiah, they are now strengthening your case and weaponizing you to show you, see, even Jews who don't believe in Jesus agree these Old Testament texts are about Messiah. Now, Muslims, you agree with us, Jesus is Messiah, you buried Muhammad. You understand how this is helping you destroy these Mohammedan pagans, stone kissers, who like to use Tovia Singer horn, bed with Tovia Singer, because he's also a fat spiritual dog and slob like them, another son of the devil. Because if rabbinic Judaism is your friend, then these rabbinic Jewish sources and these Jewish sources, some of which are before Christ, all agree these Old Testament passages are about Messiah. Now, Muslim, you agree with us, Jesus is the Messiah. That means you must agree, Jesus is King Messiah, and the kingdom belongs to him, and the nations belong to him, and they're going to obey him, not Muhammad. Burial, Hamza. So your prophet belongs to Jesus. He's under the feet of Jesus. Burial, Hamza. Thank you for appealing to Rashi and Targum Ankelos. We got it? Is it helping you? So now you understand what Genesis 49, 8 to 12 is all about. See the, You see the spiritual slut she keeps calling me? Sarah, why are you a spiritual slut? Why don't you go to the Shia and sleep with them and leave me alone? Because I'm blocking you now. You know that, right? Okay, I thought so. Shut up, Sarah. Go to the Shia to do muta. Okay? Ya bint muta. My goodness, Sarah. There you go, Sarah. Go to the Shia. Ya bint muta. You think I don't know that you're a Muslima being sent by your husband because he's less man than Aisha was. All right. A lot of snack bar, a lot of snack bar. Are everyone learning? You guys got it so far? I'll never be popular because I won't be politically correct. Okay, if that's done, now let's go to his explanation. His explanation 
of what it means for Muhammad to be Shiloh, that the nations will be gathered to him. Are you ready now? So if we saw what these passages mean. So if I ask you, when Jacob prophesied over Judah, Genesis 49, 8 to 12, and said that the ruler's staff will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Do you now know what it means? Let me explain what it means. You got to understand your Bible. I don't want you just to learn how to refute the Muslims. I want you to learn what your Bible means. So what does this prophecy mean? Now, let me explain what it means. Jacob, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, is prophesying that rulers will come from the line of Judah and that will terminate with Messiah. Because when Messiah comes, he will be the last ruler in this line from Judah because there'll be no other king after Messiah because Messiah is the end. That's it. When you come to Messiah, you're at the end because Messiah will be the last of the Judahite kings because when he comes, he will be the everlasting king whose kingdom cannot be destroyed, who rule forever over the earth. That's why it ends with him. And Jacob saw that in a revelation thousands of years before there were even kings from Judah's line culminating in Jesus. Are you with me there? David came about 900 years after Jacob prophesied. Jesus comes about 2,000 years later. And yet Jacob, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, saw and prophesied over his 12 sons and he prophesied over Judah, saying, Judah, your line will be the line of kings. Kings will come from your line, and the last king will be Messiah, because the kingship will terminate with him, ends with him, because after him, there'll be no other kings. You get it? You understand what the prophecy is saying? That Jacob knew. Now, my question is, how did Jacob know 900 years before David was born and God appointed David from the tribe of Judah to reign? When Jacob prophesied, he then died and his sons had not become a great nation. They were still in Egypt and Jacob didn't even live to see Moses being sent to bring them out of Egypt into the promised land because the Bible is supernatural. The God of the Bible is real, and God showed these men in visions the future, and the Spirit then had them pronounce the future, and then had these writers preserve these prophecies. Are you getting it? That's why later prophetic books mention this. Here, let me show you. Let's go to the Bible. There you go. Watch here. You guys think I'm lying? Here you go. Jacob, long before any of his sons became a numerous tribe, because this was 12 sons. 400 years later comes Moses, and he takes that nation, where all the descendants of the 12 sons, and brings them into the promised land. And then 900 years later, David is born to become king from Judah, long after Jacob died. And yet Jacob said, Judah, from you will come kings. From you will come rulers. And the ruler's staff, will never be taken away from you until Shiloh comes. Because when Shiloh comes, he's the last of the kings. The kingship culminates in him because he'll be the king that rules forever and never be displaced. You guys understand the prophecy or no? Do you guys understand the prophecy? So if I were to ask you, what was Jacob prophesying? Now you got the answer, right? So now how did Jacob know thousands of years of history in advance? How did he know that 900 years later, a king would arise from Judah and the kingship would remain in his line, David, culminating in Messiah, Jesus, which is why now 2,000 years later, Israel has no Davidic king, no king from Judah, and after the temple, they cannot prove beyond any reasonable doubt anyone is the son of David anymore. Truly, when Jesus came, the scepter culminated in him, and it's no longer to be found among the Jews because it's with him in heaven. And he's going to come down with it 
on earth at the second coming. A remarkable prophecy. Are we getting it before I move on? I can't move on if you're not getting it. And I'm going to show you corroborating prophecies. Here you go. From David himself. Here, 1 Chronicles 5, verses 1 to 3, 28, 4 to 7. Here you go. 1 Chronicles 5, verses 1 to 3. Pay attention. And corroborating what Jacob already saw hundreds and thousands of years in advance. 1 Chronicles 5, verses 1 to 3. Ashton, I don't care what you see, you don't see. The Hebrew word is Shiloh. Go compare other translations before I have to send you to Mecca, Ashton. Don't be a nuisance. Here you go. 1 Chronicles 5, verses 1 to 3. Here you go. Corroborating evidence from other prophetic books that come centuries after Jacob's death. 1 Chronicles 5, verses 1 to 3. Okay. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because he polluted his father's couch, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. Uh, Joseph, if I have to change subjects before you, I'm going to bring the Shia on your mother. Because I did a session showing that Isaiah 53 was explained in reference to a dying figure who would be raised and exalted to heaven. And the later Talmudic sources say Isaiah 53 is about Messiah, which actually buries you. Because why would later rabbis agree this is messianic when they're now weaponizing Christians to bury dogs like you? So, Joseph, return to your vomit before I get the Shia on your mother and shut your mouth. Anyway, for the rest of you, are you paying attention? Reuben was Jacob's firstborn son, but because he defiled his father's bed, by sleeping with one of his father's concubines, he was then punished and lost the status of firstborn and lost the inheritance. So the status of firstborn and inheritance was given to Joseph. Okay, Joseph, then shut your mouth. Don't change the subject. That's what you get for changing the subject, Joseph. That means you're stupid. You're not helping me by changing the subject. Okay, everyone got it? So then, who's reckoned as firstborn in status in terms of inheritance? Joseph. It was given to his sons. Are you seeing it? But then, what tribe was appointed to be the tribe of rulers? Watch here. Though Judah became strong among his brethren, and a prince was from him, yet the birthright belonged to Joseph. You caught it? Now, let me write this down. Reuben was the one born first. But because he defiled Jacob's bed by sleeping with his concubine, Jacob then had him displaced, and the right and status of firstborn inheritance was given to Joseph and his seed. Even though the ruler came from Judah, and Judah, his line, brought forth the one who'd rule over Israel, still it was Joseph who was given the status of firstborn in the inheritance. Are you seeing it there? So though you would think Judah would be given the status of firstborn, the position of firstborn, because the rulers came from him, no, it's given to Joseph by divine fiat as punishment for Reuben's sin and as God exalting Joseph over his brothers. Though Judah became strong among his brothers and a prince was from him, yet the birthright belonged to Joseph. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn, of Israel, Hanoch, Palu, Hazron, and Carmi. So we understand prophecy now? Are you understanding prophecy? Curiates and everyone, you understanding? Are you getting a lot of meat? Meat you won't get in other churches or in even colleges. You understand how it's working? Jacob already foresaw, because Holy Spirit revealed to him, rulers are going to come from Judah. And 1 Chronicles 5, verse 2 stated that from Judah came the prince, the ruler. And yet Joseph was still given the status of firstborn, meaning the one who's preeminent, greater than his brothers, and the inheritance, even though Reuben was the one born first. So who was given the status of firstborn? 
And the inheritance, Joseph, even though he's son number 11. But who was born first? Reuben. But which tribe produced the rulers? Judah. Are you learning a lot of, about your Bible, guys? Are you learning a lot about your Bible? So Reuben, born first, but because of his sin, he lost the status of being firstborn. Because if you're the firstborn, you're preeminent over your brothers, and you're the heir. He lost that. So son number 11, Joseph from Rachel, was given the status of firstborn. So he's supreme over his brothers, which is why they bowed to him in subjection to him. And he was given the inheritance. And yet rulers came from Judah. Is it all making sense in your Bible? How God is supernaturally working in history and working out these events to bring about the ruler from Judah, who is the Messiah, Jesus, Shiloh, Shiloh? Okay, we got it. Now watch what David says. First Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 7. Watch what David says. This is David announcing that his son Solomon would be his heir to build the temple. First Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 7. This is David speaking. Yet the Lord God, Yahuwah God of Israel, chose me from all my father's house to be king over Israel forever. For he chose Judah as leader. That's what Jacob saw. That's what Jacob was prophesying. Thousands of years of history before it unfolded, because the Holy Spirit, who's the God of history, revealed it to him, had him pronounce it, and then Moses recorded it. Jacob saw that the leader, the ruler, the king would come from Judah. And in the house of Judah, there are many clans in Judah. So which clan? My father's house, Jesse. And among my father's sons, because Jesse had eight sons, he took pleasure in me, David, right? To make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for Lord Yahweh has given me many sons, he's chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord Yahweh over Israel. He said to me, it is Solomon, your son, who shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. I will establish his kingdom forever if, conditional, if he continues, if he obeys me, continues resolute and keep my commandments and my ordinances as he is today. So do you understand what's happening? Let's break it down. Jacob foresaw, because they, they're not only told, they see. God allows them to see the future because he's the God of creation. He can show you the future before it happens, and he can show you the past because he's the God of the past, present, and future. He's in control. So Jacob is seeing, by revelation of the Spirit, the future of his sons. And the Spirit is moving him to prophesy, and then Moses records it. So Jacob foresaw rulers will come from Judah. And then as we read the narrative, see the Old Testament is sacred history. It's God's words and deeds revealed in history as he's moving people and events to bring about the fulfillment of the coming of Messiah. So Judah... Right? Enters the land from Judah's clans. God singles out Jesse. Jesse, eight sons, singles out David the youngest and gives him the throne and then appoints Solomon as his heir and on and on and on and on until Shiloh came. Because what did Jacob say? When Shiloh comes, that will end and culminate in him. Because after Shiloh, there'll be no more kings from David, from Judah, reigning. And is it a coincidence that after Jesus and the temple of Jerusalem destroyed, Israel has no longer had a Davidite ruling in Israel as king? And to this day, even if they had someone who tried to be a king, you could not conclusively prove he's a son of David because the gene genealogical records that were kept in the temple, were destroyed in 70 AD. So right now, you can claim anything, but you cannot conclusively prove it. As God's imprimatur and way of showing, Jesus is Shiloh, and the kingdom culminates in him, and after him, there is no Davidic king. You see how it works? Coincidence? How it all marvelously is fulfilled in our Lord 
because the prophecy said the ruler staff would be given to him and the nations would have to turn to him and obey him. Is it a coincidence after Jesus and the temple destroyed, the Jews have been scattered for 1900 years until they finally returned. And even now they could not prove conclusively your son of David. There, there is no means of doing it because of them mixing in with the nations. There is no possible way, apart from revelation, of showing this man is truly a physical descendant of David because this was God's way of saying, Shiloh has come and the staff is his and the kingdom terminates in him. Now, you understand what the prophecy of Jacob and who Shiloh is? Who Shiloh is? Ashton, here, let me let me help you and answer. You want an answer, Ashton? Here you go. Here's your answer. There you go. Hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Hope you enjoyed it, Ashton. I hope your answer, that answer helped you. All right. Anyway. So well, you can assume that God blessed Judah because he wanted to protect Joseph from being killed, even though that's not the reason given. It's an assumption. Let's not assume. Let's just. Take it as God's favor toward Judah, like God favored Joseph. It's like saying, why did he favor Joseph? God is free to single out people for specific tasks, right? Asking why. Here, let me call heaven and ask. So, Ashton, I hope you enjoyed your answer. So, if we got that, can I move on to the next part? Notice how... I quoted the Old Testament to understand the Shiloh prophecy. And I quoted rabbinic Judaism, who agree with us it's about Messiah. And yet Hamza Yusuf cannot quote to you the context of these prophecies. And he cannot show you the intertextuality, how the books of the Old Testament are arranged to further clarify, illuminate these prophecies. Nor can he quote the rabbis in context, but quote them out of context and then run to the Hadith literature because he cannot be honest to our sources because if he quotes them in context, it proves Muhammad is the son of the devil under the feet of Jesus. You see the difference? You see the difference? Now, can we now finish it with the two minutes left in that section on Shiloh? He's got a two-minute spiel to explain. Shiloh means to whom it belongs, right? And what belongs to him? Look what he says, guys. Look at the audacity. Let's finish it. Kitty Lason, you're learning too? You guys are still okay? You're not tired? You're not bored? I can continue? Because I'm up. I'm wired. I can go another hour, God willing, or more. Up to you. You okay if we keep moving forward? And you are really, honestly, because I want to be used the Holy Spirit to bless you. Honestly, is this blessing you? Are you growing, understanding, and being transformed and seeing how deep the scriptures are and how beautifully and marvelously consistent they are with one another? All right, and Christina, I'm going to give you the link in a minute so you can ask me your questions. Amen. May the Holy Spirit preserve us all. All right, let's finish the last two minutes of this particular section of Shiloh. So here it is at the 50-minute mark. So he says, Shiloh means he who is praised or to whom it belongs. So now watch his spin. What belongs to him? And you could his demonic face, his trance. What belongs to him? Let's see. Well, one of the most amazing hadiths in our tradition. From you see what he did? How did he explain it? He went to the Hadith. Did you catch what I didn't do? Did I quote any New Testament passage? I quoted Genesis in context, Chronicles, and rabbis, the very rabbis he cited. He mentioned Rashi and the Aramaic paraphrases of Jews, Targum Ankelos, to show you what it means. What did he do? He runs to the Hadith. Okay. Ibn Malik is the hadith of the Shafa'a. Shafa On the day of says. judgment, it says, nasu ila ba'd. The people are like waves going into one another. They're so confused. They go to Adam and they say, 
make intercession, be a shafi', be a paraclete, be an advocate. Did you catch it? It's not mine. Let's do laha. You catch, you see how he butchers the Old Testament and then he appeals to the hadith to show to whom it belongs. And then the hadith has Muhammad saying, when they go to Adam, he'll say, it's not mine. See, it doesn't belong to me. And then they're going to go to Noah. It's not mine. It doesn't belong to me. Then they're going to go to Abraham. It's not mine. It doesn't belong to me. Moses, not mine. And then Jesus. And Jesus is going to say it belongs to Muhammad because Jesus prophesied Muhammad is the paraclete of John chapters 14, 15, 16. And paraclete means intercession. So what belongs to Muhammad is the intercession because he's the paraclete. And Jesus points everyone to Muhammad, the paraclete, because that's Shiloh. And Jesus is giving him the ruler staff. That's his explanation. Listen. I'm not the Shiloh. Then he's crying. Ibrahim. This effeminate queer. Crying like a effeminate queer. And he says, It's not mine. It's not mine. It doesn't belong to me. I'm not Shiloh. I'm not the Paraclete. And it's Jesus who points people to the Paraclete. And so that's when the Hadith Jesus points to Muhammad, the Paraclete. Oh, it belongs to him. Oh, you effeminate queer, snow licking pagan whose prophet is in hell. They go to Moses, Kalim Allah. Allah. It's not mine. Then they go to Jesus. These are all the, the sons of Judah. They go to Jesus. He said, It's not mine. Did you hear? He's the Ruh of, of God and his logos. Did you hear? Did you hear he just admit the hadiths call Jesus Ruh Allah and Kalimat Allah calls him Spirit of God and Logos. Did you hear it? Here. From the horse's mouth. One more time. On the day of judgment, Listen. it says, The people are like waves going into one another. They're so confused. They go to Adam and they say, Make intercession. Be a shafi' Be a paraclete. Be a be paraclete. An advocate. It's not mine. It's not mine. I'm not the Shiloh. I'm not what the I Shiloh. can alaykum be Ibrahim. <laughs> they go to Ibrahim. <laughs> Khalil Allah. <laughs> and he says, <laughs> Lestu laha, it's not mine. It's not mine. <laughs> I can alaykum be Musa. Listen. They go to Moses. Kalim Allah. Fayu'ta Musa. Fayu'ta Lestu laha. It's not mine. Listen. Then they go to Jesus. These are all the, the sons of Judah. They go to Jesus. He says, it's not mine. They know Ruh Allah wa Karimatu. He's the Ruh of, of God and his logos. For you to Isa, for you call less to lah, it's not mine. So he just admit the Quran and Hadith called Jesus Ruh Allah, his Ruh spirit, and Kalimat Allah, word of God, his logos. He just admit Jesus is the word of God and the spirit of God, Kalimat Allah, Ruh Allah, the logos. You heard it from his mouth. Did you hear it? This is the 51 minute mark. Did you hear it? And yet though he quotes the hadith where his fake prophet says Jesus is spirit of God, word of God, the logos, he still has Jesus saying, it's not mine, go to Muhammad. Pay attention. But I can alaykum be Muhammadin. He prophesies the paraclete. Paraclete, that's means the next one. The intercessor. Intercessor. And he's the one that tells them to go to Muhammad. See that? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They come to me. This is my maqam. See, I am the one to whom it belongs intercession. Because I am Shiloh and Paraclete. See what he did? I'm now going to bury him with this hadith and the claim that Jesus prophesied Muhammad as Paraclete. Because that's what we're going to go into next. Because they tie in Shiloh and Paraclete, tie in. Okay. I take permission. In the heaven, he's called Ahmed al Shafi'ah. So he praises him. He, he, he's not able to do it now. It's given to him through inspiration on that moment. I fall into Sajda. 
And it, sa it said to me, Ya Muhammad, Ya Farah, said, raise your head. Hold. You say and you will be heard. Finish it, yeah. Ask and you will be given. Intercede. And he's crying like a little queer bait. And, and you will be <laughs> given the intercession. And then he says, oh This my. woman raping, woman prostituting, pedophile, pervert, murderer, stone licker. He's going to be the one that Jesus says, that's the one. That's the paraclete. That's the Shiloh. It's not mine. It's his. The one who had revelation come to him in Aisha's panties and her dress. My people, my people. My ummah. My ummah. In Deuteronomy 18, okay, now that's uh, through it. 17 through 22. Okay, let's is, stop. All right, you got it, right? Let me now go to the part because I want to tie in because he tied in Shiloh with Paraclete. Let's see what he says about the Paraclete. And then we're going to destroy that. And then remember, I'm going to do a part five, six, seven, God willing. Maybe it'll take me three more parts, but I need to so we can do justice. Now, let's go to the Paraclete. Did I mark it? Let me see. I should have marked it. All right. I'm going to have to find it for you. Yeah, no, I didn't. Okay, I didn't mark it down, but I'll find it. Paraclete. It's not lying. All right, let me find it for you. So let's tie it in, the paraclete, so we can bury him for today. And Lord willing, in the other parts, we'll cremate him. So let's jump to the paraclete, where Jesus says, I'm lying, I'm lying, man. I don't wanna. Okay, watch here. And we're going to tie it in. So let me go to where he mentions the paraclete. Let's see. All right. Let's go. Let's see. Where is it? Let's see. All right, guys, just give me a second. Let me find it. All right, let's see. I have to find it, guys. I should have marked it. I thought I did. Why didn't I mark it? I don't know. Let's go. Oh, yeah, it's right here. Okay, I got it now. Okay, I got it. Okay, right here. One hour, five minute mark. Listen. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that curseth thee. And rabbis, who, who I know, and I asked him, do you have a rabbis? In terms of the Christian. Here. One hour, six minute mark, the, the paraclete. And we're going to tie it in. And Lord willing, I'm going to refute the rest. Uh, mentioning of our prophet. John 14. 15 through 16. This is Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham both mention this. This is the verse that they give and they say that in Surah As-Saf when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Jesus said that he's going to give good news of a prophet. Okay. Uh, that he says this. Listen. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. So in the Greek, Kego. My New Testament Greek's rusty, but uh, it's clearly says Kai alone, Kai alone, Paracleton. Alone means another helper. Yeah. Uh, alos, this is accusative. Alone is different from heteros. I'll get into that. Let me make this case so we can end it with this. And then, Lord willing, in part five, we'll go into the rest of the stuff. But listen, because you're going to learn. Christians interpret this as the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Okay. But John says that Christ will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Okay. The Quran says the Holy Spirit was with Christ. Okay. This says another paracleton. Philo says that paracleton is, is an intercessor or an advocate. The name of our Prophet, according to Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, his most prominent names, Muhammad, Ahmed, Shafi', Shafi'. Shafi' is literally paracleton. That's what it means. It means the intercessor. No, it doesn't. And well, let me explain what I mean. Parakletos is not the same thing as per perikleitos. Perikleitos means praiseworthy. And that corresponds to Muhammad. But he's saying, he's a little slick here. He's being slick. One of Muhammad's names is that he's the Shafi, meaning intercessor. And paraclete, paracletos, can mean one called alongside of another 
an intercessor. So he's now smart. The older argument went like this. Let me show you how smart he is. The older Muslim polemic went like this. That Jesus mentioned Muhammad by name and that originally in Greek it was Peri Kleitos. Peri Kleitos. Okay, you guys ready to learn? And then, Christina, I'm going to give you the link to come and ask me questions. They go that originally the Greek said Peri Kleitos. And that would be praised one, praiseworthy. Okay? And that would correspond to Ahmed Muhammad. But then it was corrupted. It was corrupted to Paracletos. 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 Okay? There is not a single textual, historical, <clears throat> archaeological evidence that it was originally para Kleitos, oops, I misspelled it. Sorry, guys. Oh, boy. I hate when this happens. Hold on. Peri Kleitos. Okay, one more time. All right, Peri Kleitos. There is not a single shred of historical, textual, archaeological proof that originally John would have had Peri Kleitos because unlike Hebrew, Aramaic, which is a consonantal text, Greek has vowels, Right? Every extant copy, church father citation is paraklitos, paraklitos, different vowel, <clears throat> voweling, okay? So the older argument went like this. Originally, the Greek would have said paraklitos, but it was corrupted to paraklitos, no evidence, no proof, no shred of evidence historically, textually, right, or archaeologically. Every extent copy and every reference by any church father, it's paracletos. You with me there? Not pericletos, because Greek has vowels, unlike Hebrew Aramaic. And by the way, what motive would any Christian scribe have to change it from pericletos to pericletos? What motive would they have to do that? None. All right. Put that aside. His argument is a little more sophisticated because he's a little smarter because he's learned from Christian responses. Since he knows historically, archaeologically, textually, he'll get buried with the claim that was corrupted from Pericletos to Pericletos. Now he goes with another argument. Well, one of Muhammad's name is he's Shafi'ah, intercessor. And parakletos can mean intercessor, an advocate, one call alongside another as a helper to advocate, to defend. So yes, Muhammad is shafi'ah, intercessor, and that means parakletos. You understand his argument? You understand his argument? So I can move on to the next point. Brethren, are you learning? So I can move to the next point. So then we can bury him and we'll be done with part four. Lord willing and Christina, Christina I'm going to give you the link. I'll open up the Q&A. All right. Now, the second argument he's making, it can't be the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit was there before Jesus and with Jesus and was actively involved with Jesus. But this parakletos would only come when Jesus leaves. That's his argument. So how can the paraclete be the Holy Spirit? When Jesus says the paraclete, will come after Jesus leaves, John 16, 7. So those are his two points. Parakletos corresponds to Shafi'ah, intercessor, and that's one of Muhammad's names. And the Parakletos would only come if Jesus leaves, but the Holy Spirit was already there. So Jesus didn't have to leave for the Holy Spirit to come. And yet he has to leave for the Paraclete to come. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is not the Paraclete. You with me there? You understand his argument so he can finish his points and I can refute it? Okay, ready? All right, let's 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 finish it. The rest of it, okay. So then I can bury this argument. This is why Jesus on the day of judgment is the one that says he's the one that knows who the intercessor is. The other prophets... 
don't men they say go to the next prophet. So they have to go through all the prophets. So and then when they get to Jesus, he says, go to the intercessor. You see why I combine this part of Hamza's rant that Jesus prophesied the paraclete with Shiloh? Because he said in the Shiloh section, Jesus says, go to Muhammad, he's Shiloh. And later on, he tries to explain why. Because Jesus was the one who says Muhammad is the paraclete. He was the one told Muhammad would be the intercessor. Whereas the previous prophets pointed people to the next one. But Jesus pointed people to Muhammad because it was Jesus who said the paraclete, the intercessor Muhammad would come. See why I'm combining the two together? You see how devilish, satanic, wicked, and evil this is? Someone who doesn't know the Bible. And in this lecture, there are Hindus, Buddhists, and Jews. And baby Christians, nominal Christians who don't know their Bible, who sees this dazzling display of rhetorical flourish and deceit and connivory and trickery, and he will then hoodwink them into thinking, wow, what a powerful case. Because he's like his father, the devil, right? But aren't you glad the God of the Bible is real, the Father, Son, and Spirit, the one true God, the God of Scripture, Father, Son, and Spirit, they are real, and Jesus is alive in the flesh, and he raises up his servants, and I pray we're all Servants of Jesus, fill the spirit to expose these liars and muzzle them. All right, well, let's finish it. Okay, let's finish his point so we can now do the burial. All right. I'm not the paraclete. I'm not the paraclete. It's he's coming after me. Did you hear it? Did you hear what he said? Jesus saying, I'm not the paraclete. He's coming after me. Watch how he contradicts himself and humiliates himself. Listen to that again. Jesus on the day of judgment is the one that says he's the one that knows who the intercessor is. The other prophets don't mean they say go to the next prophet. So they have to go through all the prophets. But then when they get to Jesus, he says, go to the intercessor. I'm not the paraclete. You see? It's he's coming after me. You see that? Paraclete. And after you hear, and you should see his demonic smirk. Watch how he just, because when God wants to make you look stupid, he allows you to say things to embarrass yourself. He just said, Jesus said, I'm not the paraclete. Okay. So now he's going to go to an Arabic dictionary to tell you what the word shifa means. Instead of going to a Greek lexicon to see what paraclete means, and it does mean intercessor, he goes to the Arabic. Watch. Hans Wurz Dictionary. Okay. Shafia. There it is. Shafia. It's in Hans Ver. Shafia. Intercessor. Advocate. Mediator. That's our prophet. And he's also called Ahmed al-Shafi'ah. Ahmed is the name that goes with Shafi'ah because his name on the day of judgment is Ahmed. That's who he's called on the day of judgment. Muhammad is his earthly name. Ahmed is his name on the day of judgment. Okay, did you catch it? She says, I'm not the paraclete. He's the one. And one of Muhammad's name is uh, Shifah. And Hans Weir says it means mediator, intercessor, advocate. And paraclete means advocate, intercessor. There you go. Now watch, he's going to quote John 15, 24, 20. So be patient, brethren. We're going to go into meat. And then also when the advocate comes, who will I send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who come? He will testify about me. That's so fine. the prophet Isaac told us to believe in Jesus. So we believe in Jesus because he told us about him. In Luke, okay. it says that the Holy Ghost descended already in so the shape of a dove. And a voice came from heaven and said, Thou art my beloved son. We don't have a problem with that when you look at David was called a son of God. Look at his life. Uh, in the Old Testament, other uh, Jewish prophets were called sons of God. Look at his uh, life. Uh, all, Allah. The prophet said, Allah. said, All of you are children of God. Iyal Allah, those of you who speak Arabic, I'm going to address this point because if it is true, there's a statement. I've already found evidence. This is a forged statement. Muhammad did not say we are the sons of God. That would contradict the Quran. But let him just finish his point so I can wrap up his point. So we're going to have fun. So he's his beloved son. And the I'm well pleased. I mean, that sounds like yeah. somebody who's over to somebody who's under. Okay, now let's wrap up his points. Let's see what his points are. Listen, Jesus said that... He, God would send another paraclete. The word paraclete can mean intercessor advocate. One of the names of Muhammad is Shafi'ah. And if you go to Hans Weir Dictionary, Shifa'ah, Shafi'ah means advocate intercessor. 
the paraclete cannot be the Holy Spirit because the Bible says the Holy Spirit was already there with Jesus and he was there before Jesus, but the paraclete wasn't there because Jesus had to go for the paraclete to come, right? That's the second point. Third point was the Hadith confirms that Jesus is the one who points people to Muhammad because it was given to him to reveal that Muhammad is the Shifa intercessor, the paraclete, not to the other prophets. And you heard him say that Jesus is basically saying, I am not the paraclete. Muhammad is the paraclete. You heard that, right? You guys heard that, right? Now, when God wants to embarrass you and make you look stupid for blaspheming the God of Scripture and perverting it, he will do it in such a way where you become humiliated and a joke. And those who have eyes to see and ears to hear will never take you seriously, but despise you for being a blasphemous Bible pervert like your father, the devil. You heard him say, Jesus on the Hadith is basically saying, go to Muhammad, because it was revealed to Jesus that Muhammad is the paraclete. I'm not the paraclete. Go to him, right? Okay, but watch this. Wait, 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 guys. Now we're going to have fun, Kiri Laysun. You thought this was embarrassing. Did you remember what he quoted? Let's go to one hour, six minute mark. Look what he quoted and he forgot. Watch this. Okay. Watch what he quoted. Okay. Look what he quoted. Watch here one more. Okay, watch here. In terms of the Christian uh, mentioning of our prophet, John 14, 15 through 16, this is Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham both mentioned this. Listen. This is the verse that they give, and they say that in Surah As-Saf, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Listen. that Jesus said that he's going to give good news of a prophet. Uh, Watch her. That he says this. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. So in the Greek, kego. He will give you another advocate. Another advocate. Listen. Uh, so my my uh, New Testament Greek's rusty, but uh, it's clearly says kai alone alone parakleton. Alone means another helper. Another helper. The Christians interpret. Wait, 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 wait. If the paraclete is no, another no. paraclete. Another paraclete. Wait, guys, wait. If alone paracleton means another paraclete, that means there was one other paraclete. So there isn't just one paraclete, there's two. And he even emphasized the Greek. Alone paracleton. Another paraclete. But he then has Jesus saying, as he paraphrased the Hadith, I'm not the paraclete Muhammad is, but hold on. You just quoted John 14, 16, where the Greek is alone, paracleton, another paraclete. So there is another one. There's more than one. There's someone else who's a paraclete, which is why this one is another paraclete, because there's a paraclete before him. So how can he have Jesus saying, I'm not the paraclete Muhammad is, if Jesus said, God will send you another paraclete, implying there was one before him who's also the paraclete. Who is that other paraclete? Now let's go to my article again. If you go to my article, I have a section called Jesus and the Paraclete. Jesus and the Paraclete. Here it is, my article. What's up, Carla? What's up, Miha? Mihita? I love you, sister. Even Sarah was Abraham's sister. But anyway, pay attention, Mihita. And learn. Now watch here. Another, right? Okay. Let's see. John 14, 16 to 17. Watch here. It's in my paper. Watch here, guys. Let's have fun. And I will pray the Father, and he'll give you another counselor, alone, paracleton, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him, nor knows him for knows him you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you all right another paraclete alone paracleton which means there is someone else who's also the paraclete well let's see who the other one is same john 
1 John 2, verses 1 to 2. 1 John 2, verses 1 to 2. Carla, you got to be listening to my sessions more often if you want to grow, sister. 1 John 2, verses 1 to 2. My little children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Perakliton echomen proston patera. Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Jesus is perakliton echomen proston patera. Jesus is the paraclete with the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the paraclete with us and in us. There's the other paraclete. Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the expiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Wow. So Jesus is the paraclete, and the Holy Spirit is the other paraclete, both Son and Spirit are two paracletes. Jesus is the paraclete with the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the paraclete from the Father who is with us and in us. Did you catch it? Again, we are blessed one more time. 1 John 2, verses 1 to 2. You got it, Hope. Oh, you didn't know this? Hope, wait. Hope, you went to Liberty Seminary. You didn't know this? You didn't learn this, brother? <laughs> Watch here again. 1 John 2, verses 1 to 2, specifically verse 1. My little children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. There's that word with the Father. Paracliton, echomen, proston, patera. We have a paraclete with the Father. Who is it? Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the expiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. Now it makes sense when Jesus says, in John 14, 16, okay? And I will pray the Father, and he'll give you another counselor, alone, perikliton, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Why did he say another? Because I am the other one. I am the paraclete. But the spirit will be another paraclete. And now let's talk about the word alone. Alone is the accusative of alos. Okay. Come on, Carla. Don't distract me, sweetie. Okay, mijita. All right. You with me there? So that's why he said, I will pray that the father gives you another paraclete because I am the paraclete. And the Holy Spirit is another. Now, the word alone, alos, means another of the same kind. There's another word called heteros, like heterosexual, right? Heteros means another of a different kind. Heterosexual. Homos, right? Same. Alan, same. Alos, right? So he didn't say another of a different kind, heteros. Alos, another the same kind, because the Spirit and the Son are both God, they're both divine, they both possess the same nature, and they both perform the same function of coming alongside believers, empowering them, interceding for them, overseeing them, and preserving them. You hear me there? Okay. So, but I thought, he has Jesus saying, I'm not the paraclete. Muhammad is the one. When the verse he quotes saying, the paraclete is another paraclete, then who's the other one? Jesus. So we got that first point? Did we get that first point? Was that clear? Now, let's go on to show you. It can't be Muhammad. It has to be the Holy Spirit. Why? Now, let's, let's finish it. John 14, verses 16, 17, and 26. John 14, verses 16 to 17 and 26. Yeah, that's where you get homosexual, heterosexual, right? Alos, homos, they have the same meaning, meaning the same. Homoi, similar. Heteros, different. Now let's see who the paraclete is. 
John 14, 16, 17. And I will pray the Father, and he'll give you another counselor, alone, Paracleton, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. So wait, the world cannot see him, cannot know him. But now watch the mind-blowing part. Jesus to Peter, James, John, and Thomas, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Ooh, ouch. Wait, 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 wait. Jesus says, Peter, James, John, Thomas, Matthew, they already know the paraclete because he's already there with them. You know him because he's here. And then later will be in you. Was Muhammad there with Peter, James, John, Matthew, and Thomas? He was there? And then Muhammad came and lived in them and indwelt them. So Muhammad can live in multiple people at the same time. So he was in Peter, James, and John. So Muhammad is omnipresent. Did you catch it? You know him, Peter, James, John, Philip, Nathaniel, Thomas, because he's already with you and then will be in you. He's already with us, yeah. He's with me, indwelling me, working through me. These miracles I'm doing with the Father and the Spirit. The Father is doing the miracles. The Spirit is doing the miracles, and I'm doing the miracles because Father and Spirit are here with me, present with me, working through me. So you know him because he's with you. You're seeing the works he's doing with me, and then he'll be in you and do the same works through you. So that's Muhammad. So Peter knew Muhammad, Matthew knew Muhammad, Philip knew Muhammad, and Muhammad came and lived in them and, and dwelt them. So that now Hamza made Muhammad omnipresent, a pre-existent divine spirit, because Muhammad wasn't even born. That's what Hamza wants you to believe. That's what Ali Atiyah wants you to believe. All right, but let's continue. Right? Now, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit... But wait, I thought Hamza said it can't be the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Yes, it can be, because in verse 26, O Paracletos to Pneuma to Agion, the counselor who is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you what? All things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, you're, you're telling me Muhammad came 600 years later and reminded Peter, James, John, Philip, what Jesus told them while he was on earth with them? How? They were dead by that time. How did Muhammad remind Peter, James, and John what Jesus taught them? They were dead by the time Muhammad came. And now you want me to believe that Muhammad is the Holy Spirit? Really? Now, do you want me to show you the fulfillment of his promise? That the Holy Spirit reminded Peter, James, and John when he came and indwelt them all that Jesus had said and helped them understand what Jesus had said? Do you want me to show you John confirming, John confirming that when the Holy Spirit came in us, he did what Jesus said the Spirit would do, remind us of what Jesus did and said and help us understand. You want me to show you that? You guys ready or are you tired? Can I show you? Remember what it says here? He will come after I'm gone to be in you and remind you what I've said and enable you to understand. Can I show you that, guys? All right, here you go. Follow me. Watch here. Remembrance, right? Read it. And he'll bring to your remembrance all I've said. All right, let's see if that's what the Holy Spirit did. Watch here. Watch here, guys. Let's see if you get it. John 2, 13 to 17. Let's see if you pay attention. John 2, 13 to 17. He will bring to remembrance all I have done and said. John 2, 13 to 17. Pay attention, brethren, please. R.C. Lynn, here's the fulfillment. John is writing later after Jesus has gone to heaven and the Spirit has come and he's indwelling them. John 2, 13 to 17. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen 
and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business and making a whip of cords. Oh, but Jesus is lovey-dovey. I don't see Jesus in you, Jesus. Whip of cords. He drove them all. He actually made a whip of cords started whipping people. I don't see Jesus in you. Anyway, with the sheep and oxen out of the temple, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of treat. Now watch here. Remember what John 14, 26 said? He will bring to remembrance all that I have said and done. Catch it. John writing after the fact, after Jesus has gone and the spirit is now indwelling him. Look what he says. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for thy house will consume me. Say what? There's the fulfillment. We later remembered what Jesus did, and now we understood he was fulfilling prophecy. Well, John, who reminded you and helped you understand and recall the Holy Spirit after he came on us? Do you see the connection? Do you see it? Well, wait, John 2, 18 to 22, same chapter. Another thing Jesus said that they remembered and then finally understood. Because when the Spirit would come, he would remind them. You remember when Jesus said that? Now, this is what he means. Oh, wow. See, it's the Spirit who helps you remember the words of Christ and helps you understand the words of Christ. We need the Spirit to remind us and help us understand the words of Christ. Because without the Holy Spirit, we won't get it. Here you go. John 2, 18 and 22. Let's see if you catch it. When he comes, he will bring to remembrance all I have said and done. All right. John 2, 18 to 22. John 2, 18 to 22. The Jews then said to him, what sign have you to show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? Now watch. But he spoke of the temple of Zadi. When therefore he was raised from the dead, notice it was only after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered. When did they remember? After Christ was risen and glorified. Because that's when the Spirit came. His disciples remembered that he had set this and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. They remembered again only after Jesus was raised and glorified and sent the spirit. Do you remember what John 14, 26 said? Let's see if you remember it. One more time. And then I'm going to combine it with something else. Hold on. Watch here. Watch here, guys. John 14, 26. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The disciples remembered. That's what Jesus said and fulfilled the scripture after he was raised. Now, when would the Holy Spirit be given to them? All right. Let's see if you're going to catch this. Let's see if you guys pay attention. John 7, 38 to 39. John 7, 38 to 39. Brooklyn, let's see if you're going to catch this. John 7, 38 to 39. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet, the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So let's see if you're paying attention. We're told that the Holy Spirit was there, present, in the person of Christ, but would only be given to believers, indwelling them, empowering them, after Christ was glorified. So when Christ died and was raised, glorified, only after that would the Spirit be given to them to empower them, remind them, illuminate them to understand and preach and do miracles. We caught it? Only after Christ was glorified, right? Would the Spirit come and remind them and help them understand what they couldn't get at first? After his resurrection, glorification, we got that? Because I'm going to give you the final example of them remembering. John 12, 12 to 16. 
When would the Spirit come and remind them and understand the things they heard and are reminded of? After Christ was glorified, raised, ascended, and the Spirit would then come and indwell them, empower them to understand and recall. All right, let's see if you catch it then. John 12, 12 to 16. Let's see if you catch it. The Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. After he's glorified, the Spirit would give in and they'd remember. All right, John 12, 12 to 16. The next day, a great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming in Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young ass and sat upon it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on an ass's colt. Now watch. His disciples did not understand this at first, but when Jesus was glorified, John 7, 38, 39, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Of this he was speaking of the Spirit, whom the believers would receive after Christ was glorified because he had not been given yet. Now watch. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered. You making the connection? It was only after he was glorified, they remembered the things he did and now understood it. Things they didn't understand and were confused. After he was glorified, they now remembered and understood. Why after he was glorified? Because that's when the Holy Spirit came and was given to them to empower them to remember and understand. Then they remembered that this had been written of him and he had been done to him. It's not only clicking. The connection with John 14, 26, hope. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, when the Father is in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of what I said. Bring to remembrance what I said. When will they be reminded and remember? When the Spirit would come to them. He would then enable them to remember and then help them understand what they couldn't understand at first. But when did the Spirit come to them? After Christ was glorified. Are you seeing the pattern? John 2, 13 and 22. Then they remembered. John 7, 38, 39. The Spirit would not be given until Christ was glorified. After he's glorified, the Spirit would give it, be given to them. John 12, 12 to 16, the disciples didn't understand, but after he was glorified, then they remembered and understood. I will send the Holy Spirit to remind you. Exactly. Mind-blowing, scary, right? And what's more mind-blowing is how the Holy Spirit gives us such power and wisdom to recall, remember, and understand the same Spirit that did it for them and filled them is filling us. And doing the same thing for us because he'll keep doing this until the Lord returns. So we are a testimony. That spirit that lived in them is living in us. Doing for us what he did for the holy apostles. Who do you think is enabling me to remember these verses, understand them, and connect them? The almighty, beautiful Holy Spirit, our Lord, our God, our love, our life. Whom we need and depend on. You're seeing it. Right? So when would the Holy Spirit be given to them? Let's see if you understood that. When would the Holy Spirit be given to them? When Jesus was glorified. Did they have the Holy Spirit before he was glorified? No. Was the Holy Spirit with them? Yes. Was he working through Jesus? Yes. But was he in them to empower them? No. Only after Christ died, rose and was glorified, then the Spirit was given to them. To indwell them, empower them, teach them, illuminate them, and remind them. So one more time, John 14, 26. So we can see it. Okay. It's right there. It's the Holy Spirit. Okay, watch here. So how many paracletes? John 14, 26. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit... O paracletos, to numa, to agion, butchering the Greek, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit. Was he already there? Was the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, already there? 
Already was he there? Yeah. John 14, 16 to 17. Yes, he's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, was he already there? Here you here. Yeah. John 14, 16 to 17. One more time. And I will pray the Father, and he'll give you another counselor. So there are two. Jesus is the other. To be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But last time I checked, when Muhammad is on the earth, many people saw him. But the Holy Spirit is invisible by nature and cannot be seen unless he chooses to be seen. Right? Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, Peter, James, John, Philip. You know him. How do we know him, Jesus? For he dwells with you. He's here right now. He's with me. He's in me, working with me. And the Father's in me, working with me. And will be in you. And the future, he'll be in you. How in the world can we, this be Muhammad when Jesus just said, the Spirit is already here with you. The paraclete is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. And he's already here with you, though he's invisible and the world can't see him. You know he's with you because he's working through me, doing the miracles with me and the Father. So the miracles are proof he's now with you. And then later he'll be in you doing the miracles through you. Why didn't Hamza Yusuf quote John 14, 17? In his presentation, he quotes John 14, verses 15 to 16, but he didn't quote 17, where he says the world cannot see him, but many saw Muhammad, and you know him, because he's with you already. Muhammad wasn't with them and will be in you. And Muhammad cannot be in them. Was Muhammad there with Peter, James, John, Philip, Thomas? And did he later come and live in them and empower them, work through them? So does Hamza want us to believe that Muhammad is a pre-existent divine spirit who then later became flesh? Is that what he wants us to believe? Okay, you see how easily this is destroyed? So now, how many paracletes? I will pray the Father. He'll give you another, another paraclete. Who's the other? Jesus. 1 John 2, 1. Jesus is the paraclete with the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the other paraclete with us. So according to the Bible, you have the divine Son who became flesh as your paraclete with the Father in heaven. And the Holy Spirit, this other divine person, as a paraclete with you, working in and through you. That's why the Bible says you have two intercessors. You have Jesus in heaven as your intercessor and the Holy Spirit with you on earth as your intercessor. Here it is. Romans 8, 26 to 27. How many intercessors? Watch here. Romans 8, 26 to 27. Romans 8, 26, 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And he, God, who searches the hearts of men, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit of intercession who's now in you, with you, moving you how to pray and what to pray. Because the Holy Spirit knows what God's will is for you. And he knows how to teach you to pray in line with God's will. So the Holy Spirit is our intercessor and paraclete that's indwelling us. And Jesus is the other paraclete in heaven, which is why he's the other intercessor. Romans 8. 34, but we're going to read Romans 8, 31 and 34. Romans 8, 34, but we're going to read Romans 8, 31 and 34. What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? If you unite yourself to Christ, God has acquitted you. If you remain faithful to God. It is God who justifies you, declares and makes you righteous. Who then can condemn you? Is it Christ Jesus who died? Yes, who was raised from the dead? Who's at the right hand of God? Who indeed intercedes for us? Wow. Jesus is our paraclete who intercedes for us before the Father. The Holy Spirit is the other paraclete who intercedes for us 
as he's with us indwelling us. Two paracletes, two intercessors. Why didn't Hamza Yusuf quote these verses? Why did he ignore the verses of John 14 and ignore 1 John 2, 1 and ignore Romans 8 where we're told Jesus and the Spirit are two paracletes, two intercessors, and instead he ran to the Hadiths where he has Jesus contradicting himself. I'm not the paraclete. Muhammad is. When he just got done quoting Jesus saying, there will be another paraclete proving Jesus is the other one. Now let's wrap it up, and I'm going to give the link to people who want to call me, like Christiana, Christina. But here's where it gets even worse for our friend Hamza. Oh, you thought this was bad? Let's agree with him. Let's agree with him that, you know, Muhammad is the paraclete. Let's agree, okay? Watch how humiliating is going to get now. All right? John 15, 26 and 27. Look at how embarrassing it's going to be for him, okay? Okay? John 15, 26, 27. And yet people respect this clown as a scholar. Ah, oh, okay, guys. Let's do the cremation of Hamza, Yusuf, and Ali Atai. John 15, 26, 27. But when the counselor comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. So if Hamza is right, Jesus sent Muhammad out of heaven from the Father into the world. Does Hamza believe that? I will send the paraclete out from the Father. So Muhammad was there with the Father, and when Jesus went, he goes, Muhammad, time for me to send you into the world. He believes that? So Muhammad is a pre-existent divine person, existing with the Father, and then being sent by Jesus out of heaven into the world? Really? And then Jesus says, and you also are witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. So like Jesus sent the disciples and the apostles into the world to bear witness of Jesus, Jesus also sent the paraclete, the advocate, the spirit of truth from the Father into the world to bear witness with the disciples. Does he really believe that? Does he believe that? So ask Hamza. So you're telling me Muhammad was there as a divine person before he became flesh with the Father, and Jesus then poured out Muhammad, sent Muhammad from the Father into the world? All right. Hold on. What about John 16, 7? John 16, 7. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. See, that's the thing. The counselor will not come to you. See, I got to go for him to come. But he just told you he's already there. Yes, he's already here. But he won't be in you until I'm glorified and I leave. But if I go, I will send him to you. Okay, and again, I want to ask the question. I want to ask the question. Does Hamza believe Jesus went and then he sent Muhammad? Because Jesus says, when I go, I will send him to you. So does he really believe Jesus sent Muhammad? So Hamza Yusuf, Ali Atay, I hope someone brings these rebuttals to your attention. And you cowards. You sons of the devil, you pagans who follow this demon who's burning in hell, Muhammad, will answer my challenge. Here is for you um, EF Dawa girls and SF, SC Dawa sissies and Hamza Yusuf and Hamza Mayat, you cowards, you stone-licking pagans following a pedophile who's burning in hell, answer my challenge. Do you agree Jesus sent Muhammad into the world? Yes or no? Because that's what these... Verses say, will you say yes, Isa sent Muhammad into the world out of the Father's presence so that Muhammad was there as a pre-existent divine person whom Jesus sent into the world? Take me up on my challenge. 
And then what about this part? John 16, 14 and 15. The paraclete, who supposedly is Muhammad, look at this. John 16, 14 and 15. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Do you agree that Jesus owns everything that belongs to the Father? That all that the Father has is Jesus's? Jesus owns everything the Father has? So what the Father owns, Jesus owns? Jesus possesses all that the Father possesses? And that the counselor would confirm that fact? So that means you, Hamza, agree Jesus owns heaven and earth, every creature in heaven and earth, which means Jesus owns you, your children, your wife, and your Muhammad, which is why Muhammad is under feet of Jesus, because God the Father owns all creation. God the Father owns Muhammad and you, and yet Jesus owns everything the Father owns. So Jesus owns all of creation, all the heavens and the earth, everything in them. So he owns your Muhammad, which is why Muhammad is under feet of Jesus. Do you agree? Do you accept the conclusion? Do you accept that? So again, I want Hamza Yusuf, Hamza Mayat, Ali Atay, and these other stone lickers to tell me we agree Jesus sent Muhammad, the paraclete, from the Father into the world and that Jesus owns everything the Father owns. And since the Father owns all of creation, Jesus owns every creature, owns all the heavens, the entire earth, everything in them. So Jesus owns us. He owns Hamza Yusuf, Hamza Mayat, Ali Ate, and he owns Muhammad, our prophet, and our prophets beneath the feet of Jesus, crushed under his feet. Will they agree to that? You guys think they'll agree? So then let's explain why Jesus said, I must go for the counselor to come if the counselor is Holy Spirit. So let's now wrap it up. Let's explain why. And then, Christiane, I'm going to give you the link. Why did Jesus say, I must go for him to come? Well, let's explain it. Let's now look at it, explain it in context, all right? So let's read it. Here it is again. So we can show you how not. So didn't I say you're going to learn how not to interpret Scripture, how to interpret Scripture, and you're going to learn the depth of these passages? how they point to Jesus and how he fulfills them and how they apply to us. Just like the Holy Spirit reminded the disciples and helped them understand Jesus' words, it's the same Holy Spirit filling you and I if we worship and love the same God of the apostles, which is why we are able to remember, recall the biblical verses and explain them. A miraculous work of the Holy Spirit because he's alive, he's almighty, and Jesus said he'll be with believers forever. And never leave us. So the same spirit that was there in the apostles is here with us, filling us. For the glory of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see it? That's how it applies to you and me. How does this passage apply to you? Well, it's the Holy Spirit who reminds you of the words of Christ. And enables you to understand the words of Christ. And empowers you to obey it. He's been doing that for all believers from the beginning, and he does it for us today. May I be a proof of it, and may I not be proud and arrogant about it. Okay? Now, let's see why Jesus said he must go for the Holy Spirit to come if the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, and the Spirit is already there. Let's reread it. John 16, 7. John 16, 7. Amen. So may the Holy Spirit own all our hearts. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So, okay. So the counselor wasn't there? Yes and no. He was there, but he wasn't there in the sense that he would be later on. What do I mean? Is there proof that the counselor is the Holy Spirit who is already there? Yeah, here. John 14, 16 to 17. So let's explain what he means. John 14, 16 and 17. Watch this. Pay attention, everyone. So when he says, I must go for him to come, Jesus already said, he's here. The counsel of the Holy Spirit is already here. 
but I have to go for him to be in you. Here you go, Ryan, everyone. Focus. Here's the answer. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. Here's your answer, Brooklyn. You know him, so he's already here. You guys know him. He's here right now because he dwells with you and will be in you. That's his point. If I don't go, he won't indwell you to empower you because he's with me in all his fullness working through me. But now when I leave, he will then begin working in you and through you. So yes, Jesus affirmed the council was already there and the disciples knew that he was there because they saw the miracles he was doing with Christ. But then Jesus had to go for him then to indwell and empower them and work through them. That's what he means. He didn't say he's not there. He's here. Here it is. One more time. Brooklyn, everyone else. So understand what he does not mean. One more time. Here it goes. Even the spirit of truth from the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, Peter. You know him, John. Thomas, Philip, you already know who the counselor of spirit of truth is. How do we know him, Jesus? Because he dwells with you. He's right here. He's here with me. And by the way, this is the same chapter where he says, he who sees me sees the Father. So Jesus has got done telling them, the Father's here and the Spirit is here with me because it's the Father and the Spirit working with me and in me and through me. So when I do a miracle, that's the Father doing the miracle and the Spirit doing the miracle because the Father and the Spirit are present in all their fullness working through me using my physical body. So my Father is here. The Spirit is here and I'm here even though I'm the one, only one who became flesh. I'll get to that because he did say it's okay, Kirile Sun. As a liar, he said that. I'll, I'll refute that in part five, God willing. But everyone caught it? Are you seeing that Jesus clearly stated the counselor is here with you? Okay. But I must go for him to be in you. So he's with you. But when I go, he'll be in you, working through you, empowering you. Are you, you with me there? So is it clear that if you read Jesus, he did say the counselor is the Holy Spirit. And he's already here, right there on the screen, read it. He is with you, but I must go for him to be in you. Now, why must he go for the spirit to be in them? Here's why. If you read John in context, John gives you the answers. Here's the answer. John 1, 32, 33. Here it is. John 1, 32 to 33. Here you go. Here's the answer. Just read John. John 1, 32, 33. Not the Hadiths. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. Here's your answer. From the time of Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit appeared visibly in the shape of a dove as a sign for John the Baptist. He's the one that I will remain on in all my fullness. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom... You see, visibly see, the Spirit appear in visible shape, descend and remain. This is he who baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. There's your answer, brethren. You better pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help you to understand and remind you of these sessions and recall them perfectly. Because once you know the answer, you destroy Islam. Because the reason why the Holy Spirit would only later indwell them because right here, when the Holy Spirit appeared visibly in the shape of a dove, for John the Baptist to know for certain Jesus is the one, he came in all his fullness, and from the time of the baptism until Jesus' glorification, the Spirit remained on him and him alone and would only be given to others when Jesus finished his work and was glorified. And that's where you get John 7, 38, 39. You see how it makes perfect sense? John 7, 38, 39. You see how it makes perfect sense? Here it is. 
So when the Holy Spirit came upon him in all his fullness and remained on him throughout Jesus' entire earthly ministry, he would remain on him and him alone and only come and indwell and empower believers after Christ was glorified. Here it is, John 7, 38, 39. Jesus speaking. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive. Why didn't they receive him then? Here's why. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. That's why. That's why Jesus said, I must go. After my death, resurrection, and ascension, after I'm glorified, then he will be given to you to indwell you, empower you, and preserve you and transform you. But if I remain, he'll remain on me. So he's with you because he's in me working through me. But I want him to be in you working through you. And he'll do that when I leave. You got your answer now? You see how marvelously consistent, beautifully consistent, and miraculously designed our scriptures are? No real contradictions, errors. For those who are empowered by the Spirit, reminded by the Spirit, taught by the Spirit, illuminated by the Spirit, it's perfect, miraculous, majestic, and beautiful because it's the voice of God. God's zigun. Everyone got it? Did you get a thorough refutation of this Bible pervert and pagan Mohammedan stone kissing idolater, right? Distortion of John. And I already have done plenty of sessions on my channel with David Wood on the paraclete. Plenty. This is not the first time. But we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something repetitively to become second nature. Christian tradition. Go to my description box here. Every session, I try to link to some of my rebuttals articles. If you look at my description box, I gave you a slew of articles rebuttals on these. Is that clear to everyone? So now let's wrap it up with the Hadith. Remember the Hadith he quoted where Jesus says, I'm not fit for that. Go to Par Muhammad, the paraclete. I'm not the paraclete. Well, let me quote the part he didn't quote. This is from the paper. Here it is again in the description box. And Christina, get ready. I'm going to give you the link. If you have questions, to so call me on StreamYard. Okay. This is the section in that paper. Here's what you're going to find. And we're done with part four. Oh, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You want eggs at the bar? This is the subsection. Here are the hadiths. Okay. Look what he didn't quote to you out of embarrassment. Aisha Buley, the side collection of Al-Bukhari, chapter 68, book of Tafsir. Here's the link. Can you tell me why he didn't quote it in full? Watch here. He just gave you the gist of the hadith, but he didn't quote it in full. After now, I show you what it says in full. Even though it's a blasphemy and it robs Jesus of his glory, but thank God Asa of the Quran is a satanic counterfeit. It's not the real Jesus. But even this counterfeit is better than Muhammad. And he used the counterfeit to bring them to the Jew Jesus. Look what it actually says. He alludes to it, but didn't quote it fully, and you'll see why. The Hadith, remember when they all go to Adam and Noah and, oh, it's not for me. Go to Okay, watch here. Look at this. It's a lengthy one, so I'm going to quote the relevant part. Sal Bukhari. They will go to Isa and say, oh, Isa, you're the messenger of Allah and his word. Remember what Hamza Yusuf said? I go, remember what he said when he quoted it? Your ruh Allah. He's the ruh spirit and he's the logos, kalimat Allah. So Hamza admitted that the hadiths confirm Jesus is the word of God, logos, tayu, and ruh Allah, spirit of God, tuma tayu. All right. Well, that means he's God. He's eternal. You are the messenger of Allah and his word, which he cast to Mary and a spirit from him. You spoke to people while in the cradle and to seed with your Lord on our behalf. Now watch. Do you not see what we are suffering? Esau will say, pay attention. My Lord is angry today with such anger as has never existed before nor will again. And he did not mention a sin. What Hamza Yusuf did not emphasize is that in these hadiths, 
Every prophet mentions a sin they committed against Allah, making them feel unworthy and guilty, including Muhammad, except Jesus. In the Hadith, when Muhammad is narrating, Muhammad acknowledges Adam, sin, Noah, sin, Abraham, sin, Moses, sin, and he's a sinner, except Jesus. Why did he emphasize that part, that among all the prophets, the only one said to have no sin and mentions no sin is Jesus, even though this Jesus is a counterfeit. And he did not mention a sin. Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, right? Go to someone else, go to Muhammad. Now watch Muhammad, though. Why did he mention this? Why did he mention that this hadith has Adam acknowledging his sin, making him unworthy? Noah acknowledges his sin. Abraham acknowledges his sin. Moses acknowledges his sin, making them feel unworthy. And Muhammad is a sinner. And Jesus is the only one said to be sinless without a sin. Now watch the rest of it. They will come to me, this is Muhammad speaking, and say, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad, you are the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. Now watch. Allah has forgiven you your past and future wrong actions. Literally, Allah has forgiven you your past and future sins. Intercede with your Lord on our behalf. Do you not see what we are suffering? Did you catch it, my brothers, sisters? Are you catching this? Muhammad says that he's a sinner whose sins past and future have been forgiven. All the other prophets have sinned, making them feel unworthy. But Jesus has no sin, which is why he mentioned no sin. Why didn't Hamza Yusuf emphasize that? Why didn't he quote it to his audience of Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, nominal Christians, and Muslims, atheist agnostic, so they can see that even Esau, this counterfeit, is better than Muhammad, who's burning in hell? Why didn't he quote that? But you want to see how stupid Muhammad and Islam is? Now remember, guys, this is the day of judgment, right? Now watch how stupid Muhammad is or the compilers of the Heath. This is the day of judgment. How can Muhammad say that Allah has forgiven his past and future sins when this is the day of resurrection and after the resurrection, there'll be no more sins? What in the world is Muhammad smoking saying, Allah will forgive my future sins? What future sins? It's the day of resurrection. I thought from that moment on, there'll be no more sins, you moron. You caught it? You see how stupid he is? Your past and future wrong actions. What future? All his sins are past. He died and was raised. You're telling me that Muhammad will continue to sin even in the new heavens, new earth, in Jannah? Stupid? What did I say? When God wants to embarrass you and make you look stupid and humiliate you for perverting the Bible and blaspheming Jesus, he will do it in such a way well, no one will take you seriously. Is our God amazing or what? Okay, but let me give you other versions. It's all in my post. Here's another version. Okay. So Moses tells them, go to Jesus. Now watch here. This is another version of, from, of the Hadith from Sahih Muslim, book one, number 378. Here's the link. Another version. It's all in my post. And get ready. Sal Racinos, thank you, brother. I uploaded your musical hits. Thank you, brother. Okay, now watch here. Look at this. So Moses is going to say, I killed the person. Right here. Now watch here. So I'm not worthy. So watch here. So quoting Moses, look at here. So I'm Muslim. I just gave you the link. I, in fact, this is Moses supposedly speaking on the day of resurrection, kill the person. So I sinned. I committed murder. I'm unworthy. Whom I had not been ordered to kill. I am concerned with myself. I'm concerned with myself. Nefsi, nefsi, my soul, my soul. You better go to Jesus. They would come to Jesus and say, Oh, Jesus, thou art the messenger of Allah, and thou converse with people in the cradle. Thou art his word, logos, like Hamza Yusuf admitted, which he sent down upon Mary, and thou art the spirit from him, ruh Allah, Hamza Yusuf admitted, he's the spirit and word of God. So intercede for us with thy Lord. Now watch. Now watch what he says again. Does he mention any sins? Moses mentioned he murdered someone. He said, all the rest mentioned their sins. 
Don't you see the trouble in which we are? Don't you see the misfortune that has ta overtaken us? Jesus would say, Verily, my Lord is angry today as he had never been angry before or would ever be angry afterwards. He mentioned no sin of his. Wow, another version. Say Muslim. But what about Muhammad? Okay. So now watch here. Watch how stupid this religion is. And I'm going to give you one from Jami Tirmidhi. Watch here. Okay, so he mentions no sin. He simply said, I'm concerned myself. Nafsi, nafsi. My soul, my soul. I'm concerned myself. You go to someone else, Go better go to Muhammad. They would come to me and say, oh, Muhammad, thou art the messenger of Allah and the last of the apostles. Now watch the stupidity again. See how stupid Muhammad is. Allah has pardoned thee all thy previous and later sins. What later sins, idiot? This is the day of resurrection. You're going to enter Jannah. You're going to continue to sin even in Jannah? So you're going to need to be forgiven even in eternity? Salami alikum, buddy. All right, salam and see you, the, the peace of Messiah. You see how stupid this is? Final one, Jami Tirmidhi. These are all sahih, sound. All right, Jami Tirmidhi, book 37, hadith 2621. Here's the link. And we're wrapping up. I hope you enjoyed it, brethren. I hope you liked it. I hope you're blessed. I hope you were challenged, convicted. You learned a lot. You learned the depth of Scripture, the beauty of Scripture. And, and I'll have greater love and awe of Scripture and the God of Scripture. And you now love the Holy Spirit even more, seeing what kind of gift the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son. And the work He does, that's why we need Him. And without Him, we're nothing. And why your Bible is supernatural. Here's the link. And how stupid Muhammad is in this religion. And how these clowns are not scholars. So here, watch here. Again, another version. Okay, another version. Watch here. So we can wrap it up. And get ready, guys. You have questions? Christiana, you'll be the first. We'll see how many questions we take. They will go to Isa and say, Oh, Isa, you are the messenger of Allah. And his word, which he placed into Maryam, and a spirit from him. And you spoke to the people in the cradle, cradle, intercede for us with your Lord. Don't you see what has happened to us? Then Asa will say, today my Lord has become angry as he has never been, before been angry and will never be thereafter. Now watch. He will not mention a sin. The same hadith in three different hadith collections, Bukhari, Muslim, and Tirmidhi. And all of them say Jesus is the word of God, the spirit of God. Spoke in the cradle, did miracles, and has no sin and mentions no sin. Whereas everyone before him mentioned a sin, making them feel unworthy. And Muhammad is the worst of the sinners. Just watch here. Watch the rest of it. Watch here. But we'll say, then Asus will say, we'll say, myself, myself, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Go to someone else. Go to Muhammad. Planet, get out of here, man. Get this guy out of here. He said, they will go to Muhammad, and they say, O oh, Muhammad, you are the messenger of Allah and the last of the prophets, and your past and future sins have been pardoned. Again, future sins? So Muhammad, after the resurrection, will continue to have sins that need to be forgiven? Will you not intercede for us with your Lord? Don't you see what has happened to us? Okay. Now, can I ask you a question? Since Adam, Noah, Abraham, and Moses felt unworthy to intercede, unqualified because of sins they committed, and yet Jesus is sinless, and yet Muhammad is a sinner who will continue to sin even in eternity. How does it make sense to say Jesus is unqualified to intercede when he's sinless, God's word and spirit, and Muhammad is a wicked sinner who's going to continue to sin in the future after resurrection, even though the other prophets were unworthy to intercede because of their sins. So how can Muhammad be worthy and Jesus unworthy? How in the hell does this make sense? How does it make sense that the sinless Jesus, who's God's word and spirit that entered Mary become flesh, will be unworthy to intercede, whereas Muhammad, 
whose past and future sins have been forgiven. So he's a sinner, is worthy, even though the other prophets were unworthy because they sinned. How does this make sense? Or do you see this is another attempt by Satan, Muhammad's father, to inspire Muhammad to deceive people thinking this Antichrist who's burning in hell is worthy, though he's a sinner, and yet Jesus, the sinless word and spirit sent by God to become flesh, is unworthy. Jam, this is, you want to respond? This is how you respond. Jam, this is how you respond, brother. Get the hell out of here. If you're that stupid, you can't uh, respond. Don't come back here. Go to Mike Winger's channel. If you're that stupid, you can't refute them. Don't waste my time. We're not going to repeat the same arguments 5 million times. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this session. And you saw how the Bible is supernatural, miraculous, divinely inspired and divinely designed to point to Jesus and how real our God is, how beautiful our God is, how irrefutable his word is. If you know it, understand it. And what a gift the Holy Spirit is because he is from the Father and Son. He is the one who fills you, teaches you, reminds you, and enables you to understand the things he reminds you and convicts you and empowers you to obey it. Because without the Holy Spirit, we are nothing. Why do you think I'm constantly praying to the Holy Spirit? Because of Jesus' words. He will remind you. He will teach you. He will guide you. And he will reveal new things to you when you're ready to handle them. Without the Holy Spirit, we are nothing. You see why I'm constantly? Because I believe the Bible is true. And I believe what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and how important the Holy Spirit is in our life and how desperately we need the Holy Spirit and be in love with him and never let him go. Now that said, Christiana, you had a question? Here you go. There you go. Now in light of this, does anyone seriously believe Hamza Yusuf is a scholar, well-learned, educated, and a man of integrity, or his boyfriend and fellow stonelicker, Ali Atai, after you see what they're doing to our scripture. Okay, so now Christian had some questions, so I just gave the link. Thank you for loving enough to come to my channel, support it, because without you, I wouldn't be teaching, right? But because of you, the Holy Spirit then moves me to teach, and as he's teaching you through me, he's teaching me and reminding me and correcting me and illuminating me and perfecting me as he is you. So you're blessing me. All right. Well, he never knew Christ. So he didn't leave Christ because he never knew Christ, Mr. Deckard. Anyway, Christiana, if you can come up, come up. If not, we're going to wrap it up because it's already been three hours and 22 minutes. Pray, if the Lord is pleased, to increase our numbers of quality people. We're getting about 300 on these topics. When it's controversial topics, we get about 400, 500. But may the numbers increase of quality people and remain steady. But I want quality over quantity. May God give me contentment. All right, here she goes. All right, sister, what's going on? Hello. Wait, hold on. I can't. Can you hear me, Sam? I can't hear you on my end. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh... I can hear you. Okay, I'm just going to use the the YouTube thing because on StreamYard, I can't hear you. Um, I don't know why. So, Mike, I, I have several questions, if you don't mind, Sam. Um, what exactly is idle talk and foolish talk? So, I always talk to myself oh. like an insane person. I'm always attacked with logismoi and demons making me remember my cringe actions. It's a way You're to what? calm myself and talk it's to my angel and God. It's having a one-way conversation. So I'm just wondering if I'm doing fast. a sin, if I'm going You're crazy speaking. on my own. You're speaking too fast. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me or no? Sorry, Sam. Um, yeah, if you can't hear me, we can't do this On StreamYard, I can't, but there's a delay on YouTube. All right. Well, I can hear you on YouTube, but on StreamYard, okay. I can't hear you. Okay. All right. Well, Christiana, then we're going to have to do it in another format. It's not going to work. So, and your question, I think, is a little more pastoral. In other words, you should be talking to your bishop or your priest or your pastor. 
Your question is more pastoral than anything. And because you can't hear me, there's a delay. So this is why you guys need to be plugged in a church. And I pray I practice what I preach. You can't just come online and do church. This is to facilitate. Let me remind you. My channel is to facilitate. Used of God to teach your faith. As Holy Spirit uses me to teach you. Because he's a teacher. We're his disciples. And then you take that information. Let it transform your life. And then use that in your church. May I practice what I preach. And we all belong to solid churches locally. There are a lot of questions that are pastoral. Meaning you need your bishop or your priest to address those issues face to face in the context of the church. Not online. Especially when they're very personal. Where you perceive you're being attacked by demons. So Christina, my advice Go to your local church. Go there and ask your church for counseling and the steps you need to take to be delivered from this demonic attack on your mind so that they can work with you to show you the steps to be guarded. That's something pastoral, something that the church needs to do for you because that's why you belong to a church of qualified leadership who will give you what you need by the Holy Spirit because they are your ministers to minister to you the medicine and the food from the Holy Spirit for your healing. So that said, no, I'm not going to explain Luke 18, 19, brother, because Luke 18, 19 is also in Mark 10, 18 and Matthew 19, 17. I'm Baker. I've done 10 million sessions on why Jesus said, why do you call me good? If you don't find the answers on my YouTube channel or in my articles, I'm going to block you for not being diligent in love, but being too lazy to do a search and find the answer. See, without you telling me, I know what Luke 18, 19 is. Why do you call me good? For there's none good but God alone. Because it's the parallel to Mark 10, 18, and Matthew 19, 17. Go do due diligence. God does not honor laziness. Don't be slothful and lazy. Go to my YouTube channel, search in. Jesus, God, good, or Trinity, or salvation, and see the dozens of sessions that pop up, or go to my blog. It's called Search Engine, you lazy bums. And I say that out of love. So, brethren, let's wrap it up. And I piss on Muhammad, that whore, son of the devil, and the Shia who then did muta at your mother. Okay? So, Christina, no, we're not taking any more questions, sister. God bless you. Brethren, let's wrap it up. Pray that the Lord will grant my daughters and I divine, miraculous, supernatural, physical safety, security, protection, and give me the discipline to stay healthy. And my daughter's healthy. And if the Lord tarries, I see them grow up to be godly women. That will always be my prayer request. Pray they fall in love with Jesus and I fall more in love with Jesus and be holier and more pure, more righteous and more bold and less sinful. And pray God will do the miracle. Bring them into my life. Brethren, I really mean it from my heart. I need your prayers. Cry out to the Lord. Have your intercessory prayer words. Pray for me. Seek the intercession of the saints, the Blessed Mother. Lord, do the miracle. Ask the Lord to remove Martin Simon Yako. Mention him by name. God knows his name. He's in adultery because my ex-wife committed adultery, so she's not validly divorced. By marrying him, she made him an adulterer. Ask the Lord to chasten them and rebuke them to be ashamed of their adultery. And protect my daughters from this wicked, adulterous union until they break and repent. And she gets right with the Lord and remains celibate. And bring my daughters to me before they grow up and I lose these years. And ask God to heal my heart not to be bitter, but love Jesus and forgive and walk worthy of the Lord. And ask the Lord to provide financially for the ministry. If he wants me to do the work to serve you and keep filling me so I can fill you, being used of the Spirit. And that I will provide for my daughters and they'll be with me sooner and later because March 12th, my daughter turns 13 and I won't be there, but another man will. Please, brethren, if you love me and my daughter, stick Lord, pray for that miracle. I'm lonely without them, but Jesus is my shield and my Holy Spirit of the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, who's the gift of God. When I say my, meaning the gift, our gift. The Holy Spirit is the gift, our gift, my gift from the Father and Son, that Holy Spirit who's mine by grace, who owns me, who possesses me, who owns you, who's yours by grace, your gift. May he fill us and seal us and perfect us and rebuke Satan and crucify our flesh and enable us to love Jesus Christ perfectly. So keep praying. 
and ask the Lord to keep me disciplined, not to lose this discipline, not to fall back to gluttony, but give me the power of self-control and get back tight on my disciplined way of eating and lifestyle to get healthier and holier and love Jesus more. And Lord willing, I'll be back later. May our numbers increase for the glory of the Lord and may I be content. And I love you for the sake of Jesus. And more importantly, the Father's in love with you. The Son is in love with you. The Holy Spirit is in love with you. Because Father and Holy Spirit are the true God. Our God lives. He's more real than you can imagine. And death is not the end of us. And the Bible is his miraculous voice. Never doubt it. May we know and live and re be reminded by the Spirit to understand and obey that word for the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <clears throat> glory to the Father. Glory to the Son. Glory to the Holy Spirit. Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Christ, our Lord, fill us with your Spirit. Fill my daughters, our loved ones, with the Spirit. Cleanse us. Cleanse our loved ones, my daughters, by your blood, Lord Jesus. And keep us in love with you to never betray you or deny you or shame you. Finish the work you begun on us until you summon us until you return. And may you return sooner than later because, Lord, we confess you died, you rose again and ascended and will return physically, bodily to judge living and dead. May that day be sooner than later. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We praise you, love you, Father. We praise you, love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, love you, Holy Spirit. And I pray we mean it and not pay lip service. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord willing, see you later.